we go. Uh, welcome to the Lovecraft Easing Podcast. This is this is August 2021. Uh, for you time travelers out there, it's not 2020, so you're good. Um, today we're going to be talking with Anya Martin and James Chambers. Hey guys, how are you? How you doing? Hey, how are you? How are you, Anya? We're gonna we're gonna talk to Anya first. Um, I, I, I'm gonna have both of them introduce themselves, and of course the panelists will introduce ourselves as as per usual, and um, and then we'll talk to Anya for a little bit, and she has some things to do, and she's gonna log off. Then we're gonna talk to to James Chambers, and then we've got a few things after we talk to James, um, some miscellaneous geek stuff that we always talk about. And what we're gonna do at the very very end people is we're going to talk about loki with spoilers so the reason why we're doing this at the very end is for those of you who have not seen loki um i'm going to give you a warning so you can log off you can stop watching and um and you can come back and listen or watch later after you've seen it i'm not even a marvel guy but it's a it's a great uh um it's a great series i really enjoyed it so anyway uh I'm Mike Davis with Lovecraft Easing. I'm not even sure what my job title is. Um, podcaster's probably one of them, editor, publisher. Uh, two most important job titles, of course. As you know, Logan, uh, our dad and husband. So we'll go with those are the, most, those are the important ones. Um, Matt Carpenter, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Matt. I run Easy Movie Night. We just watched Super Deep. Um, our prize this week, if you want to enter, is a manga, volume one of Wonderland, where everybody wakes up and they're shrunk to microscopic size, just as if they had drunk the little bottle. If you oh, want to win this prize, if you want to win this prize, send an email to easingprizes at gmail.com and put wonder in the subject heading, and it could be you who wins it. Could be. Uh, let's see here. Rick, why don't you introduce yourself? Rick Lay, writer and Pulp Magazine collector. All right. And, um, who do we got left? Pete. Pete Rollick, who apparently is channeling Professor Brian Oblivion. Um. What? Brian Oblivion from Videodrome. Because the my glasses are just set perfectly to reflect back everything on the television. Oh, not, not Max Headroom. No, oh, that's sunglasses, isn't it? That's sunglasses. It's Brian Oblivion. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Do you do anything besides wear glasses or? No, or um, that's all I've been doing lately. Um, actually, you know, I, I you write I, books, though. I heard. I do. I'm like the. I guess I am the. Re, I, you know, I fought it for a long time, but I just have to accept it. I am the reanimator guy. Mister. Mister reanimator. Reanimator. Okay. Mister reanimator. Just like Rick is Mr. Encyclopedia. And I guess if we threw a title at Matt, it would be multiple titles. It would be Mr. Movie Night. I like that one. I like the sound of that one. Uh, Mr. Reviewer. Mr. Prizer. Mr. Prize. He gives out the prizes. <laughs> you, you just call me the old guy most of the time. Why are you trying to pretend to be nice now? Go well, on. it is the most accurate. Hmm. Um. Uh, tell them about movie night real quick before we move on to Anya and, and, and James. Okay, so we use an application called Cast. It lets us screen share. And every Saturday night, we show a movie that has some horror. Uh, and usually, we try and go for something sort of cosmic. I got a list of the, all the films you ever saw. If you want, I could send it to you. Uh, but basically, you just need to send... You get download the app cast. You ask to join the group Easy Movie Night. Um, we vote on the movie through Facebook over the week, and then we just show the flick starting at 9 p.m. Central Time U.S. At Google Cast, which is K-A-S-T, and then once you've done that, you look for Easy Movie Night. Now, before that, like from 8.15 or so, we've been listening to the BBC podcasts, The Shadow Over Innsmouth. So we do stuff beforehand, but the flick itself starts at 9 p.m. Central U.S. We have viewers from the U.K. and Japan, so it's pretty international. I, 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 I'm going to be putting this on the website in the next few days to a week. But, yes, um, yes, I know you will. You will. You promise. Well, well not just this, but 
we're sort of doing we're, we're doing things every couple of nights for example I, as everybody knows sundays we do this now you may maybe your habit to listen later in the week that's fine we do it live sundays at six eastern and of course i put the audio on itunes and, and spotify and other places um you know, a few days to a week later. I'm a little behind right now, but I'm catching up on the audio. So my point is that's on Sunday, Tuesday nights, almost every Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we've been doing Old Time Radio Night, which is two episodes of Old Time Radio, horror Old Time Radio mostly. I've been listening to horror Old Time Radio and other Old Time Radio sci-fi noir detective for well, about 40 years now. So I'm I'm handpicking some of what I think are the best. So that's on YouTube as well. If you if you Google Lovecraft using YouTube, you'll see these different playlists. And of course, you can listen or watch those later. Nice thing is you can like you're doing now on Sundays if you're watching live, you can um you can live chat with us while we listen to old time radio. And then um Thursdays we've got our Patreon podcast and every other Thursday night at uh, 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, for patrons only it's like sunday but it's for for patrons and then the alternate thursday nights are for the ten dollar and up patrons non-recorded zoom call where the patrons and the panelists we just all it's your chance to to hang out with us whether that's a bad thing or a good thing i don't know so um <laughs> uh alan smalling had some nice things to say about it he's like it's, it's like a little mini no economic on sometimes it's a lot of fun honestly uh and then saturday of course saturday evening at 8 30 central right matt you're muted is uh easy and movie night so i'm sorry people the old guy can't figure out how to operate so no, it's, yeah, it's, uh, we, we i open the room at like 8 15 p.m central time u.s but the movie starts at nine. So we watch, we listen to stuff in the meantime. Okay. So yeah, that gives you, that's like the, the, the news reels in the forties before the movies, you know, in fifties. So exactly. Exactly. So we anyway, also, we also I'm have a live a, chat for snark. Yes. Well, you look at the live chat now. I mean, that there's usually snark in there, probably some more snark coming. Uh, anyway, so that, you know, I'm going to put all this in a little list so that it's easy to remember with links, but you know, just, it's all about community. Um, so that said, let's, um, let's have Anya Martin and James Chambers uh, briefly introduce themselves. And then we're going to talk to Anya for a bit and then James. So Anya, why don't you introduce yourself first? Sure. I'm Anya Martin. I'm the author of the short story collection, Sleeping with the Monster from Lazy Press that came out in 2018. Um, in the, I think it was 2018 in the fall. Um, who knows what time is anymore? Um, <laughs> I have a story and my most recent published story is in Cootie Shot Required, which just came out from uh, Broken iBooks. So I know that um, Scott Gable would appreciate me mentioning that. I had a story about all the things we need to kill Squish. And I'm pleased to say that Publishers Weekly uh, called it out. Um, so uh, called out my story um, in their review of, of Could You Shot Require. So I'll, I'll assume in a positive way. Yes. And now I'm like, wait a second. What, what, did, what was the word? It's like gloriously fun or something like that. <laughs> um, but fun. And uh, I think it was gloriously fun. I should have that memorized, right? Um, I also um, am a co-producer and co-host um, of the Outer Dark podcast. We're on hiatus right now. I do it with Scott Nicolay. This was the program book from the last Outer Dark Symposium, um, the virtual symposium with a cover by Gene Diaz. Yeah, you do a lot of things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I feel like, I don't know, my, my last year has been kind of a crazy uh, sort of dream um, because I was the caretaker to my mom um, too. Yeah. So I've done, le I've been doing less, but we did manage to have a virtual symposium and we are moving forward. The podcast will be back soon and uh, we're moving back forward to planning our 2022. Well, you know, sometimes more important life stuff uh, gets in the way and that's okay. You know, I know you understand that better than anyone. Yeah. Family yeah. is super important. Yeah. 
uh i prob i may not return to this i may forget to but because i want to talk about your collection too but uh again the name of the um book you just mentioned and the name of your short story just so people can remember to look this up and, and yeah. read it um, sleeping with the monster is my collection and it's from right. Lethe press Lethe press um and uh cootie shot required Cootie uh, shot required okay uh it's from um broken eye books it was also featured in their eidolon magazine that you get with subscription to their patreon and that patreon's really cool you can read a novel by craig Gidney, that's that's in progress. A novel by Orrin Gray, that's in progress. I I can't remember all this stuff, but they but they publish the, sh the stories from their collections. Um, go there. Um, What's the well. name of your short story in there? Uh, all the things we need to kill Squish, and I'm happy to talk about that story because that story is about it's like the beginning of a series of stories. So and, and so. Okay. Well, we when we come back to you, why don't we start with that? At some yeah. point, we can talk about it. Uh, but does James? James should introduce himself. He should, and then we'll come back to the short okay. story, and then we'll move on from there. So, hey, James, hey. good to see you. Good to see you too. Thanks so much for having me on the podcast. Oh, sure. So, um, just to say a little bit about myself, I write uh, mostly short fiction, novellas, comics, and graphic novels, and things like that these days. I won a Bram Stoker Award for. The graphic novel Kolchak, The Night Stalker, The Forgotten Lore of Edgar Allan Poe, which was a lot of fun to write, if, if especially if you remember the old TV show, The Night Stalker. Uh, uh, we do on the show, <laughs> trust me. Rick, Rick, did you know about this, Rick? You'll have to ask him about this. I, I suspected it might be uh, something that had crossed your path. Yes. So, um, most recently, Raw Dog Screaming Press published a collection of my short fiction called On the Night Border. And I will be publishing a follow-up collection with them later this year. And earlier this year, Hippocampus Press published Under Twin Suns, Alternate Histories of the Yellow Sign, a new anthology that I edited. There's also a novella, um, Devil in the Green. Do yes. I have that right? <clears throat> so, and you could tell us about that a bit later, too. Yeah, I'd be happy to. That was so a lot it, of fun. Yeah, that's on Kindle for only $2.99, so... And uh, I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I've heard good things about it. So, um, all right. So thanks. Let's go back to Anya. So uh, the, the, the squish story, tell us about that. Well, Start with that. That story started from me noticing and having a dialogue in Facebook about asking for people to talk, talk about the stories that they that they knew about and loved about groups of little girls, not teenage girls. I'm talking like, let's say Stephen King, Stand By Me and It, you know, um, Creepy girls, little girls. younger, younger or uh, middle school at most, but, but, but basically younger girls. There's a lot of stories about girls that like loner girls or girls with one friend, but not many stories about groups of girls. Um, it's just like, we never had groups of friends, you know, and, or if we did, we couldn't possibly be into like spooky shit. And anyone who knows, um, sort of grew up um, as, as a little girl, many of us, I mean, slumber parties are all seances. <laughs> yeah, how can people think that girls aren't into horror? I mean, that's what they do when they have sleepovers, right? <laughs> A, we always had ghost stories and seances, but um, I mean, I was the yell bloody there. Mary at the mirror and everything. Yeah, things all like of that. that stuff. I want my liver back, um, lifting, <laughs> etc. But another big part of of these boys' stories, you know, is like creek exploration and going out, running around the neighborhood as if girls didn't do that. Or there would be like one wish fulfillment, you know, girl in the story, this tomboy that hung out with the boys, which didn't happen in my world ever we never want no one of our little group would have ever gone and hung out with the boys and done that we we totally were you know the cold cooties thing when you're like in fourth grade or so you you aren't into that you're doing your own thing and you don't cross i i don't know maybe that's changed now but but we sure didn't um Did you, you didn't listen to my uh livia llewellyn um recent uh podcast with livia llewellyn Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just made me think of her because she's like, speaking of Kolchak, James, <laughs> she's like dressing up. She dressed up as Kolchak 
her and her friends, and they would go around the neighborhood solving mysteries and everything. So yeah. that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So yes, girls do that. Yeah, we used to play witches too. I mean, I we had a whole game about witches and all sorts of stuff. I mean, I was all I did was like monster movies and you know, I, I, I like monster movies before I identified with science fiction for sure. Um, and, um, you know, a whole, that's all another story. We could talk about dark shadows and stuff like, and, you know, the entree into that, um, as, um, as a 60s, 70s kid, but could shot require, I mean, that I had this idea that I wanted to write some, a story about a group of little girls and maybe a series of stories. So this story is the first of the series of stories that are going to be about these particular four little girls. Um, the, this one, in this one, there's a monster that they call Squish or Squish, because that's its, what it sounds like. And it's a definitely a weird monster and is told in a di as, as a list. What do they need? The story is told, how did they first see it, become aware of it, and, and assembling the, what they're gonna need to kill it. And because the world won't be safe if, you know, if you don't get rid of this monster, they are very keenly aware the monster has been killing people in the neighborhood as it killed people and animals. Of course, you know, adults don't know it was the monster that did it, but they figured it out. Yeah. Um, and they come up with a plot. Um, you know, I think people may think that I was inspired by Stranger Things. I actually hadn't watched Stranger Things when it came up with the concept and when I wrote the story. I watched Stranger Things after that and was happy to see at least there were two girls in that one, but still not true to my experience. Uh, my experience, we were definitely four girls and they were, you know, they're loosely based on me and my friends. Quite honestly, this sounds really, really cool. Um, this is the first. Are you going to do a collection or just keep putting out stories in various anthologies and so forth and put them in a collection well, later? I'm thinking about it will be a collection on its own. That okay. is that's sort of what I'm thinking, but not kind of necessarily a linear story where I they might be those kinds of stories where it's the same characters, but they don't necessarily fit in a, in a precise chronology. Right. Um, you know, they, uh, you know, you can't, you don't necessarily know if they all happened, if they all, if they all happen in what order, etc. But the next one that I'm working on has to do with lifting seances and is set in the context of Watergate being on TV, um, which for anyone who was a kid at that time, you know, Watergate was the end of anything. You couldn't watch anything on TV. It took over your, took over your parents. It took over the television, et cetera. Yeah. So it's, it's in that context of that. But we used to do, when we did, I mean, we called them lifting seances. Um, other people call them different things, you know, it's light as a feather. But we had very, very complicated, complex stories about a death you described the death of the person. It was actually the person you were going to lift. And you had these complicated stories about terrible car accidents and other stuff, very detailed stories. Unfortunately, it's, it's like, I don't remember many details of the stories except for that they were very complicated. Um, so I've been like reaching out to my friends asking, what do you, what do you remember about that? Um, so I think that's, um, it was definitely part of my uh, my growing up, um, you know, in a world where Halloween trick or treating was huge. It was before fall festivals destroyed trick or treating. Um, it was you, you, you know, we wanted. This was our our world was dressing up and doing things and and going to uh, watching Friday night frights. Yeah, well, uh, where uh, cootie shots required? Um, where can people buy this? Is it on Amazon too? Is it on? Uh, it is on Amazon, and you can buy it directly from Broken Eye Books, okay. uh, or you can buy it on I, Amazon. I assume Amazon, Barnes and Noble, all of the. What um, about is is there a Kindle version of this? If somebody like I want to read this tonight or something like that. Um, well, if you want to read it right away, you can go to their Patreon and get their Patreon, uh, which I think like for a dollar a month. Um, I know you can read my story. I don't know if you can read every story in the book through the Patreon, but you can read my story and some of the stories from the, from the book. Uh, and uh, I, I just looked it up. It's 
four ninety nine on um, on Kindle. So that's pretty reasonable. Yeah, I can't imagine that any book comes out without being an ebook anymore. Yeah. Um, but Eden Royce's story in the book got nominated for a Shirley Jackson Award. Wow. So, I see Damien Angelica Walters is in here too. Is a really, really good author in the in the book. I was really excited to be in in the group. I mean, the only my only disappointment with the Publishers Weekly review is they didn't say, "Oh, it was about girls." They didn't get you know that that was part you know the point <laughs> in a yeah. way, uh, or they didn't add that in. You know, um, yeah, but, description but I like on talking it. about it because I want to say that is why I wrote that story, and that's why I want to write more stories because I think there is this secret culture. Um, you know, um, uh, I remember when I met my uh, partner, Scott Nicolay, you know, he was like, I never knew any girls like that. And I'm like, you probably did. They just didn't tell you. Right. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, and I, the I think it says, uh, so, you know, strange kids doing strange things, the secret goings on of use youth. There's some monster hunting, rewriting of reality. Fighting with parents, a secret mystical fighting tournament, tournament, getting lost in the mail, in the mall. Sorry, boy, I'm doing good today. Drifting through space, avenging a bird mama's lost egg, building a dragon. You know the usual. The kids are all weird, and we wouldn't want it any other way. So, mm -hmm. uh, is every story girls in the no. book? Okay, no. yours no, my is. My story was girls and. Um, you know, I was lucky to get into that because I wasn't part of the original table of contents, but I had been, I told Scott Gable about this story and I was going to try to write it for Eidolon. Um, actually, I was going to write the other story I told you about, but that story got, I, I don't know why, sometimes a story gets a roadblock, you know, you start writing and somehow it doesn't go. So this story was the one that took off and just was easy to write. Um, and um, so I went, uh, as it went around after the Kickstarter, he contacted me and asked me to, to be, uh, I, I like the, I was really excited that, that, um, you know, I didn't, I, I, it's so frustrating when you write a story or you're working on a story that would be a perfect fit for an anthology and that anthology is published <laughs> and you know, yeah. there may not be another one for a while and, uh that yeah. where, where it would fit and I, I know that happens to so many of us writers all the time we're like oh I wish we were asked but I wish I was asked I wish I'd known about it you know sounds like the perfect fit the I like the subtitle Co uh, cootie shots required there are things you must know so this sounds like a really interesting book yeah so. my story was written as a, as a diary too so she okay. writes it like she's got a spiral notebook where she's writing a secret spiral notebook where just in case anything happens, you know, uh, uh, you can, you know, send it, send it off to uh, the to event of my death. Um, <laughs> not, but maybe not to him. Maybe that guy who, you know, uh, who, who wrote, you know, the stranger than fiction book, you know, instead might be a better person to send it to because he'd actually believe it. Are you talking about stranger than science? Stranger in Science, sorry, yeah, all this. Did you read that book when you were a kid? I mean, yeah, we read all the, I mean, I love those oh books. Oh my I mean, God, uh, I, I stumbled they, across that book at like a, a DAV or something, you know, back when DAVs and Salvation Armies actually had books. And I was like, oh man, this is the greatest thing ever. And it was written in the 50s, you know, so. You can't remember that's the one where the first chapter is like spontaneous combustion. So I was like, yeah, oh, that's it. For somebody, yeah, that's what I thought. I think, uh, I and the guy thought. disappearing into the ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spontaneous combustion. It, it's a pretty usual thing, just like quicksand, <laughs> as the girls point out. We thought quicksand would happen a lot more. <laughs> you never know. You never know. There might be quicksand. Yeah. Killer now, to, to 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 be honest, quicksand <laughs> is you know living in the Everglades. Quicksand yeah. is it's not quicksand. It's peat. But yeah. I have fallen through and been sucked under, so it is a part of my life. I, did you, you know, did you die? Almost. Oh, okay. So so what happens is like large rafts of peat will you know peat is just decaying plants and they will it will break off of the bottom and float to the surface, and you can walk across it because it's like six inches to twelve inches thick, and then you hit that soft spot and you just 
go right through, particularly if you're like 200 pounds mm -hmm. and the person in front of you was like 100. You know, it's just, you know, the, what, the short person who's 100 pounds goes right across and you think, oh, I can make it. And you <laughs> right through. It's and then, like ice, I guess. It's like yeah. And then, you know, you're wearing waders and your waders fill up. And then, you, you know, now you don't wear, wear 200 pounds, you wear 300 pounds. And, you know, so yeah, quicksand's part, not quicksand, but, you know, being sucked under by the earth is a part of my life. Yeah. Well, we editors do not like it when uh, uh, we are skip around, you know, on our special order that we did the anthology. But I'm going to skip around and read yours first. So, you know. <laughs> so. Actually, it's the first story in the book, so. Oh, it is? See, All right, I'm not breaking any convenient. rules then. Perfect. Yeah. So. All right. So I'm doing that and I was glad to do it. I, I missed pretty much all of the HP Lovecraft virtual um, film festival because I was trying to make the deadline on that story. though. <laughs> so it was kind of a bummer that it ended up right then uh, when I was finishing it up. So uh, tell us about um, Sleeping with a Monster. That's your collection. Yeah. Um, that's the collection that has, I, I don't know, I, I feel like it's my first generation of stories, of uh, stories that I wrote over a period of time. They're like the first stories that, and it kind of has an arc that, that ties it together. Um, so I stopped it. I do have some stories published since then. Um, not as many as I'd like, because I spent, um, uh, my mother got cancer in 2018 and, it's been it's actually right when my book came out, right before. So it, it impacted my ability to promote the book as well and to do everything that I would have normally done. It, it's sort of like a weird, uh, a weird thing, but, but yeah. So what do you want to know about it? Um, those stories, some of those stories have roots that go back like before, let's say it was published in 2018. Some of those stories have roots that go back to like the early nine, as far back as like the early nineties. Um, though they weren't published till later. I, I don't know, maybe just a general flavor um, of the kind of stories that are in there. You know, if, if someone were to come up to you and say, hey, uh, what kind of collection is this? You know, what, what might you say? Well, the title, I would say that um, it's almost exclusively female protagonists um, and not intentionally, but I just found myself doing it. Maybe um, it, it always seemed natural to me. I always felt that women were underrepresented in the fiction that I read. So I wanted to read fiction that centered women. So I tend to write fiction that centers women. Um, the Sleeping with a Monster title, when I came up with the title, um, it's kind of a play. Who is, you know, what is the monster? And every story in some way might play back to that, but the monster and our monsters, what, how do we define monsters? Is the monster the evil thing or is the monster that sometimes the, the redemptive? I would say they're weird fiction stories, intentionally so. Perhaps um, the, uh, I don't know, Blackstone Roses and Granite Gazanias is a bit of a uh, ironic fairy tale. So maybe that one is a little bit off there. And I have a play in there called Passage to the Dreamtime, which I do consider a weird fiction piece, but it's not necessarily overtly supernatural, but it might, you have to decide what's going on there. Um, uh, it's, um, uh, the women are of all ages. It starts with a teen, there's a teenage girl and her dog. That it's my, my response to losing uh, a beloved family pet and a solution to never losing your family pet. So it's not pet cemetery. Um, <laughs> but no, but in many ways, it's just as horrible. Well, that's, it is sort of, I mean, I think that story is a story. I mean, a lot of these stories are born with, born out of me trying to write something with a subtle horror. Right. Uh, that story was a story that got rejected a lot because it wasn't an overt horror story. Uh, but everyone I would, I would read it to people or have beta readers, they'd be like, oh my God, they got it, yeah. you know? 
but it but it would be I always get back it doesn't fit it doesn't fit um really until the weird fiction renaissance or I went to Necronomicon in 2013 and I suddenly met different editors for which my stories fit right. before then I had a real problem mm-hmm. selling stories they would I would get back good writing doesn't fit all the time um when I submitted stuff because I guess I was writing weird fiction or weird horror but not there weren't in the 90s markets for that. So I kind of stopped for a while and just shelved a lot of the story. I love subtle horror and a lot of weird fiction is subtle horror. Um, But, uh, you know, you you and and I, I and I, Scott, have talked a lot about weird fiction over the past few years. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? And then, uh, and I know when I have weird fiction writers on here and other artists and readers uh it seems like every time i ask them in your opinion what is weird fiction i don't get different answers but i get slightly different answers i get slightly different angles on it and i know you've thought a lot about this maybe more than most um to what is weird fiction mean to you what what is it well, I hesitate to give a definition because I always feel like it is fighting words. Uh, as as well, that, that's why I say for you, um, you know, yeah. in your opinion. I think that weird fiction, I mean, I think weird fiction, well, it, it, I think weird fiction has, what we call weird fiction now has really expanded. I mean, I do think that there was a point within at least genre readers that weird fiction was essentially cosmic horror. Um, and now it's not necessarily cosmic horror. It can have a redemptive element. It, do, it isn't even necessarily horror. And that doesn't mean that we're changing. It's just that we're recognizing that there are works out there that that have a weird element. And of course there's weird, I, I'm not talking bizarro because that's right. a different kind of weird, but I see weird fiction stories, or at least the weird fiction that I write, is a story where things are not what they seem, and the protagonist begins to accept that um, as the normal. They uh, they don't question. They begin to, you know, we go from gosh, that seems weird, that can't be right, um, to to no, nope, that's the normal, and I'm going to play along with it. I'm going to embrace it. And sometimes that's a good thing. That's a way to some kind of redemption. And sometimes it's a way to your doom, but not necessarily um, like some kind of cosmic monster is going to kill you. Um, it um, can blow, it can be, um, I don't know. And monsters are, mac- when there is a monster, a monster can be mercurial too. A monster can be redemptive, but its nature is still to consume. Before you continue, um, I just want to interject real quickly, if you'll let me, um, two things. First of all, I asked this, what is weird fiction to, to again, to Livia in a different interview. This is about five or six years ago. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I said was to me, and, and I do stress to me, to you, you know, so that we don't get into fights about, you know, what it is. But I said to me, you know, one of, one of the elements is that things are not what they seem, like what you just said. Livia said something very interesting. She said, yeah, I agree. And you are not necessarily what you seem either. Uh, Which uh, I, which really made me think. The other thing I wanted to say, you mentioned cosmic horror. And tell me whether you agree or disagree. And if you do do disagree with me, that's that's fine. I, I, I guess I see cosmic horror as a branch of weird fiction, not, not the other way around. You know, it, it's a branch on the weird fiction tree, maybe. Yes, I agree. I, I agree. I think there was a point where sort of in the genre community, I, I guess we would say science fiction, fantasy, horror community, that, I mean, there were people who who really centered cosmic horror and the unfeeling universe as what defined weird fiction. Mm-hmm. Um, you would hear that on panels at, well, FantasyCon and other places, but as weird fiction is written by, uh, by, they think there are two things going on. One, we're recognizing works as weird fiction that may not have been defined as weird fiction in the past. Um, but 
in today's community, we're getting published. Um, I won't say who this wasn't being written before published. A lot of people publish from a variety of backgrounds. So suddenly what is weird fiction comes through a different lens if a black woman is writing it, for example, or, or a gay Asian man, or a, uh, sometimes that's intersectional just, just through um, someone who identifies um, as non-binary that may change what you are, uh, what you're reading. And so we're getting all these different new voices. And so we're getting really different stories, but the significant thing is they're getting published because something happened, I think around the weird, whatever, if you want to call what Scott calls it, the weird Renaissance was already going on. Um, but there was a, I can say, I think there was a window and I, when Kelly Link got published that opened a lot of doors just the stories, Kelly's stories getting published, I felt like I had a better chance than my stories. And my stories aren't just aren't like Kelly's stories necessarily, but they're like them in that they don't fit. Um, so there were a number of, of, of sort of editors who came along like Joe Pulver, who were willing to take a chance. Joe, you know, you, Joe Pulver, Ross Lockhart, um, I'm trying to think who's that, Sam Cowan, who sort of in that, period who were willing to take a chance on new authors and new voices and actively seek them out. And, uh, and I like, uh, it, it's not so much to, to me, I like changing the question a bit about, you know, not so much defining weird fiction as saying, what are elements of weird fiction? Because, and, and maybe the difference is really subtle, but to me, it's, it's significant, you know? I think so, when marginalized voices start writing, suddenly weird fiction gets changed. Yeah. Um, and weird fiction may be the way of escape or the way out of a cruel, because the, the universe is cruel already. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you're discovering the universe is cruel and not caring about you. You already know that. But suddenly weird fiction or the weird element gives you a way out. And, and it gives you something, you know, it may kill you still, but it gives you some kind of epiphany, and maybe it's a we it's a weapon against that world, um, the world that we're in. Uh, Victor said something about uh, similar about cosmic horror in a recent interview, not with me, but I forget with who about. You know, uh, it, I'm going to paraphrase him badly, but something about the fact that a, a black person in America, you know, uh, finding out that the universe doesn't care about you would just kind of laugh at that. He knows that already. She knows that already. You know, um, and I thought that was pretty significant. Whereas, you know, you got a guy like H.P. Lovecraft or, you know, uh, someone who's, I don't know, on top of the world. And then suddenly in a story, they find out they're not the center of the universe. It's kind of soul crushing for them, you know. So, the other, so, yeah. I think the other thing that plays in here is that in the, in the 70s and 80s and even part of the 90s, you know, we didn't have access. You were limited by what your local bookseller would carry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I scoured used bookstores in the 70s and 80s for weird stuff. But, you know, once again, you only got to see it if the book, if that book trader accepted it in as, as trade. So it was, you know, if you came across an issue of Death Realm or Weird Tales or, or something like that, you grabbed it up and you held on to it tight because your chances of finding it again, or and even if it wasn't quite what you wanted, you still got it because it was in your wheelhouse. Yeah. But Great. you I, didn't I, have, we didn't have like, so the big epiphany to me was like in the, early 90s I started buying from Dreamhaven books mm -hmm. and they carried a wide variety of stuff that I would never have seen that in my local bookstores yeah and it just blossoms from there once you get into the internet yeah then came the internet yeah you could get anything you want almost I think, I think that's that's absolutely true that's one factor there I think another factor was when you got things like the best of weird tales 
and was limited uh, by the gatekeepers on what stories you read. Absolutely. And so that was another factor. Uh, there were a lot of people who wrote genre, uh, science fiction, fantasy, horror, and wrote weird who never made it into this best of because there was an expectation. Gatekeepers yep. were very, very much had an idea um, sir, around the Lovecraft circle. And that does not denigrate the quality of what was published, but, but you have to open your mind to appreciate a, a work sometimes by people who aren't like you. And if you aren't yeah. able to do that, I mean, I hear from editors still today, it's like, well, we would have published a woman or more women, but the stories we got just weren't up to the same quality. Well, that's possible. Or maybe they just wrote different stories and your uh, definition of horror is one thing or you're definitely yeah, too much in a box and you can't, you aren't open to another perspective. So, and that of course goes to um, we've, we've had it uh, online a few times with regard to women, uh, but it could be authors of color or LBGTQ authors, etc. You just, uh, you know, you can put the call out. Also, if you want to get those kinds of stories, you can't just put a call out and put an announcement. You have to make sure that they find out about it, <laughs> that right. people, you, know, you have to really choose where you're going to advertise and oh, if you're really wanting a, uh, to get diverse submissions and you have to have a very open way. Uh, Chris Golden uh, did that. Is it Chris Golden? James Moore did that. Um, the Twisted Tale of Shadows, Book of Shadows, and they got Linda Addison to be one of their readers, and maybe- Oh, I love people. Linda. So it's, yeah, uh, so that's like one way you can do it if you don't, if you don't feel you, you if you have that intention of making sure you, you bring somebody else aboard to make sure that the word gets out, somebody who is um, respected in these, com in these communities. Yeah, Linda's wonderful. I saw her in, um, um, I stayed with her in Arizona when I was driving out to California um, a month ago. And I think Scott actually stayed with her last night. And we hung out with her and Jill Bauman and with um, Western Oaks and Yvonne Navarro. We're also out in Arizona, a um, little horror. Uh, yeah, she's yeah. the one who introduced me. It's well known now, but back, back, you know, 10 months ago, she's the one who introduced me to the concept of uh, long haulers and COVID. Yeah, you know, we, we we both had COVID, and I was like, Linda, I feel worse now than when I had COVID, and I just tested negative for COVID again. And she's like, "It, this is what's going on." And I was like, "Wow," but anyway, uh, you know, you mentioned Scott calling it weird, um, uh, the weird fiction renaissance. Um, some people like the way that's phrased. Some people don't like the way that's phrased. But regardless anybody would have to admit that it's it, things are far more open to weird fiction and diverse writing writers, excuse me, the last few years than, you know, 10, 15 years ago, for sure. And more so, weird fiction is getting published. Yeah. Sometimes not, you know, I, I think that that began to start. Um, I mean, I felt like uh, 2013 Necronomicon, I went with my dad and my dad was the only person there who alive who had read Lovecraft when Lovecraft was still alive at that point. <laughs> we had gotten to that point. So my dad was a bit of like some kind of a rock and roll celebrity. Um, it's, um, um, he died in 2014, but he was 89. Yeah, uh, 89, uh, Bill Martin, for anyone who um, might know of it was in first fandom. So, but when I got there, what I didn't expect um, I guess I was invited to a room party in Laird Barron's room and, and I discovered that, I mean, I knew the names of some of the authors and I read some of them, but there was this entire movement going on. And I think some people don't want to identify with a movement, but I think there was no doubt as I began to familiarize with that stuff that, that people were embracing the term weird fiction and getting published under weird fiction. And I was reading horror in the 90s and so forth. And no, I, I think we all, there wasn't any such thing. And, just, and as I said, um, when I tried to publish stuff, I would get it doesn't fit. I mean, I guess Caitlin Kiernan was coming, was writing then in Ligotti and so forth. But they were not, you know, they were sort of in their own communities. It yeah. wasn't, it didn't feel like um, there was a mass of authors in that space. The last thing I want to ask you about weird fiction, because I do consider you uh, 
to be far more of an expert than me with with this is um but i've thought a lot about it and one of the things i've discussed with other other writers uh authors on the show is uh, another facet of weird fiction is um is and i want to know if you agree with this or not it, or, and maybe another element let's say not a definition but x happened i was talking about this with laird recently x happened this this happened i have no explanation for it the end in other words something very strange happened but i don't know what it was and it was really out there uh what are your thoughts on that and whether that's a weird that's enough uh, to be a weird story I don't know if it's an element, I would say. I mean, I think... It's okay to say, Mike, you have no idea what you're talking about. No, I, I feel <laughs> like you get with me. I, I think that something weird happening doesn't make it a weird fiction story on its own. Mm -hmm. It it has to do with the reaction, I guess, perhaps the person's reaction to it and what hap how it's presented. I mean, weird things happen all the time, just weird coincidences or, or unusual things, uh, you know, um, trying to, you know, so, and certainly the world has been very weird um, lately. Yeah, one of the guys I was talking to uh, about it a uh, couple years ago was Soren Narnia, the, I don't know if you've uh, listened to any Knife Point Horror uh, podcast uh but i consider his podcast to be weird fiction many of the podcasts and i think the best episodes he's basically saying my name is john smith or whatever it is for that story here's what happened and it, it's just so freaking weird and scary and creepy you know so um you know i told him about a true story that happened with that i've told many times where i'll keep it very short because i have told it my wife and I are driving real late at night down a, a two-lane road. And there's woods on each side. And all of a sudden, we see what, what we think is a two-dimensional shadow running in front of the car from the right to the left. And in Soren's opinion, he goes, there, right there, you got like a two-line weird fiction horror story. But I, I, I don't know if I'm convinced. Um, I think that several elements have to come into play to possibly make it a weird fiction story uh, it may be one of those things where it's hard to define but you know it when you read it too so it, i think i mean i i know that kathy koja and michael kelly I and mean, kathy koja said that in the introduction to the year's best weird too something like that i know it when i see oh, it oh did she yeah i forgot um so i do think there is some element of that if you're attuned to what weird fiction is then you do kind of know it when you see it. Um, also, when you talk about a two sentence story, there are there is a weird flash fiction. I, yeah. I Greg Bosser did these ones, these really short, uh, weird like I, I forget what it was for. It was I think for a presentation that the Vandermeers did, and we were able to. He let us air them during the Outer Dark Symposium, like in between programming, and so you can do something that's weird in flash fiction, but it's a different type of, I mean, flash fiction itself is, is a very different enterprise. Uh, well, moving on, can you tell me what a stuffed bunny in doll land is? Oh, ah, <laughs> uh, I could actually have the book it's in, it's in the other room. I could run and get it. I, it is a um, four page comic story that was in Womanthology. Uh, Womanthology was 2012. And um, there was a call out on the internet. Um, there was something about women in comics being underrepresented um, to contribute to this anthology of story of comics, graphic stories um, by women, just completely by women um, writers and artists. And the idea was that it would also, there would be interviews in it with women artists and there would be how to's and it would be something you could give to your young, your daughter who want, for example, your daughter who wants to be a comics artist right. and inspire them. 
so it was a really exciting project and great. Um, I like that. Kickstarter, yeah. the Kickstarter, I think they asked for 25,000 and raised over a hundred thousand. It was a big deal uh, to be part of it. I found out about it through Steve Niles and I asked, and at that point I had had some background in the comics industry, not a lot of publications. I, I, I worked on the uh, promotional side and we used to write for Marvel age and write about comics a lot. So for, for comic scene and Marvel age, and a lot of, um, of comics related publication interview creators and stuff like that. So I pitched a story they, um, and, um, and then got to, um, uh, they sent me a number of artists to choose from, including, uh, or to, to consider. And one was Mato Pena from Barcelona. And I just loved her art, but Stuff Bunny and Dolan comes out of a, a much, a longer concept that I had. Um, about, uh, I had stuffed animals, money and elephant. One is a, a money was a bunny and elephant, uh, so obviously an elephant and their adventures. I was going, I wanted to write something about, um, I think there's a tension between stuffed animals and dolls. Um, and if I grew up being a stuffed animal little girl to my mother's disappointment, I, I always thought dolls smelled weird and were kind of creepy. So, um, but what my if my wife thinks they're pretty creepy too? <laughs> so, but what if like these dolls? You know, I the concept in that story is that you know the little girl goes with her two animals and she had to have with her mother to have tea or something at the house of a woman with a doll collection and the dolls steal elephant, kidnap elephant, and then money nice. has to rescue elephant. So it's a whimsical story. I managed to take the basic concept and put it down to four pages with some amazing art by Mato Pena. And I, uh, but I, I still am very interested in doing it as a graphic. I wanted to do it. I thought about doing it as a graphic novel. I lean more towards doing it as an illustrated book. It almost happened then, but graphic novels paid so badly at the time and even in 2012 trying to sell the concept as something that wasn't superheroes was difficult um and Mater was a complete paint she does completely painted work so she has to be paid fairly to be able to put the time in and and uh we couldn't negotiate that we would have had to just essentially almost done it for you know try to try to put uh, it together and love the concept it. i really do hope you do the um the book with illustrations i think that would do well i think uh, it would be fine i i think um i can write comics but i think it would be fine as a as an illustrated book with yeah. i think about um dean Koontz's oddkins although uh or brown or brahms um what what's the uh, one that brahm did that also was about kind of about toys awesome. there's, there's a whole lineage of stories that about toys and their adventures and toy story of course well, I just looked up. Uh, I'm sorry, Pete. Did you have something? The Brom is it Baltimore? You were thinking about? From no, no. It's it's something he did earlier, and I just forgot the title. But well, for those who are interested, uh, Womanthology uh, Heroic, published in 2012. It it is on Amazon. I'm sure in other places. Um, and I see, for example, 27 used from five dollars and 54 cents so yeah you can definitely pick this up pretty affordably it's uh, an incredible it book all the original it went for charity uh you know now if you're buying copies it's you know it won't be uh it won't go to the charity anymore but uh um, right. but it, it was it's a really incredible book an incredibly inspirational thing uh the it got a lot of buzz and we got a lot of support and then of course inevitably there were the people who were like well oh, they, they only got published because they were women. These were not the same oh, quality or as, as, if, as if it had been more competitive, if it had been men had been allowed to apply. There were all sorts of really misogynist um, responses. There's some uh, to, pretty insecure some guys women, out there. From some women creators who were not part of it. <laughs> really? So yeah, wow. it was crazy. It was kind of like just a lesson. Uh, comics is a, I've worked in comics and I felt like comics, the glass ceiling was harder to break there. I'm so glad that um that artists are doing that now now but i decided it was uh too much work for me to try to be a comics writer at that point i did think about it i, I want to say that i think that mm -hmm. you and people like you um women um uh gay lbgtq um you name it um people of color 
Uh, but let's just use the women in comics example for, for a moment. Um, you, you're not giving up. You're, you're trying. You're trying to break this, as you said, glass ceiling that's lower in comics than it is in other areas, lower than it should be in many areas. And, you know, it's, uh, you're, you're a white, you're a white male, you know, it's, it's very easy and you can't let yourself forget that women have these challenges. Uh, um, people who are not white males, they have these challenges and I can't help being a white male and I'm not ashamed to be a white male, but at the same time, I need to remember that you're facing challenges on you that I don't have to face. And I applaud your courage for not giving up because not because giving up is easy. Not giving up takes more courage. Not giving up is harder. And so I, I think a lot of you for that and people like you. So I really do. Well, it's, it's nice to be in a world now, you know, where, so I, I don't know, I, I, where you see a lot more representation. And I, I find that I don't get bored too. I mean, I think it keeps everything fresh. I can't imagine not wanting to read books with protagonists that don't look like you. I mean, I spent my entire youth reading books that with male protagonists and I, and I enjoyed them. Um, but I also would uh, sometimes identify with the woman in the book, like, uh, you know, like you read Tarzan, it's like, oh, Law of Opar, there must be a big backstory about well, Law of Opar, what is the backstory? Um, you know, uh, if we think of, uh, um, of something uh, more pulpy or, um, you know, uh, Lord of the Rings, I always thought there must be a backstory with Arwen. I'm glad she got some in the movie, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah well even then she's just sort of a more or less a love interest you know oh well, she did get to do the thing uh the ride to um yeah to which that. in the book it's uh i forget uh, the elf's Gl name uh, uh, glifindo yeah something yeah. like that yeah, yeah so it's um i i thought that was a really natural thing to have her do i don't yeah. know I almost feel like Tolkien just wouldn't have minded. He he made Luthien. Luthien killed a Balrog, so why not? Um, I was just talking to Scott today about Seal Moore and Jarell of Jory, too. Uh, you know, um, that was like something when I, I mean, I really loved her stories and, and I liked Lee Brackett as well. Um, my dad exposed me to that. So I, I think I, in high school, didn't realize quite that there weren't a lot of there weren't a lot of women science fiction authors because I was reading like all of them, <laughs> Ursula Gwynn, Anne McCaffrey, um, um, Vonda McIntyre, Joan Benji, um, and then, you know, classic older authors. Um, so I, I was aware of, um, you know. Well, I, I hope what I said didn't come out the wrong way, but I just wanted to say that I applaud, you know, sometimes when you don't have a particular challenge that other people have it's easy to forget that they do have those challenges you know you um uh i don't know easy example uh if i was an african-american father i've got a 19 year old son i i am very i'm overprotective of my wife and son but you know what i would be even more protective and i would have to tell my th my son things that i don't have to tell him now because he's white you know and it's easy to forget these things it's easy to forget the challenges that other people who aren't you face so i just think um not giving up is very courageous and that's all i'm trying to say so yeah yeah, well, I, I think I'm also on that cusp of, you know, just old enough where I knew that women could do stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the generation behind me um, was still secretaries and teachers. And my dad, you know, raised me th that I could could do things, you know, that never right. gave any, me any doubt on that. I was always expected to go to college. It wasn't like, oh, you might want to go to college. Nope. I, there was never any question that I was going to college. Never any debate um, that I was going to college and I was going to go to the best college I could get into. And my dad uh, talked me into applying to Smith College and I got in and it was, you know, at the time it was a little weird. I, I don't know. I, I, I went, I left all my friends behind. 
but I do think it was a real empowering experience in retrospect, um, going to a, a top women's college. Uh, for, for listeners may be familiar with Jane Yolen and uh, Madeline Lengel, um, we're Smith alumni, of course, so, of class. Um, so there's a lineage of producing authors and also genre authors um, as well. You know, 1988 even was a bit behind the times, but I remember watching Donnie Darko, you know, it's set in 1988 and, you know, the, they're, they're around the kitchen table and, and brother and the sister, the mom and dad, and the dad saying things about Dukakis needs to be elected. And he goes, and what, you know, if he's not something in effect of, then your husband won't be able to get a good job. And she goes like, my husband, you know, and <laughs> so... <laughs> So yeah, you're, sounds like you had a very supportive dad. Yeah, no, it was, um, I mean, my dad kind of just made, in a way, I, I feel like I would have ended up here anyway, but it's my dad who started me. Um, I don't know, I was watching Dark Shadows when I was two um, and watching horror movies from like, I mean, was never any question. So he just exposed me to everything in comics and and things. And I, uh, my mother, it's, it's funny because I didn't learn till recently that my mother, you know, she would like read me fairy tales and things and Anna Green Gables, which also it encourages imagination. But like I found, uh, unfortunately she's from Finland, so I can't read everything that she wrote, which I found in her family wrote sweet is that something where, which um, it's like a horror story, you know, she has the, all these things that she wrote that, that almost, that sound like genre fiction that now I have to either learn Swedish or get translated for me um, when she was younger. So I think she maybe had more imagination than she wants to. She's a practical Scandinavian, but she may have had more. So I'm sure she, she gave me some of that too. Well, last but not least, um, and I know you have to go, but who, who have you been reading lately and, and what's coming up next for you? I, gosh. Um, I have been, I haven't been reading as much as I would, um, I would normally because of, of um, just, I've been moving, my mother recently moved to memory care. And so there was just a lot to be done and I didn't have a lot of reading time. Um, so, but I am, uh, let me show you, I, let me just grab a book. I'll show you what I'm just about to start. Life, um, life can definitely start, get in the way. A Ghost Finders by Adam. Uh, McGromber, which I've heard great things about. Uh, she also wrote Jesus and John, which went from Lethe Press, um, and he's written a bunch of stuff. Um, this is from um, Journal Stone, uh, Trepidatio, and uh, I'm going to have him on the Outer Dark. So I'm, a lot of what I read uh, lately is is for the Outer Dark. I read Sarah Reed's collection and uh, novel this year, and she's really great. Um, and I just read, uh, who else did I? Steve Toast. Um, I just read uh, again, who else was on the show? Uh, anybody who has been on the show, it's like, then I try to read uh, as much as possible by them. Um, yeah. they you've been, on. you've been interviewing, but as far as publishing, it's a bit on a hiatus for the moment you said, I think. Yeah, I, I can say, I'll, I'll say something about that, but I'll just mention something about Sarah and, um, Steve is that they are close friends and they both have a bit of archeology span in their work. And, uh, um, uh, she, I think wanted to do archaeology and he did archaeology for a while so uh, uh, it's kind of like a little uh, a little twine there um, they're both part of uh, of um, what's the apocalyptic writers the apocalyptic writers group um, I've forgotten exactly though I, I feel bad it's like I, I feel like my memory is is, is off today but um, oh that, yeah I, that Julie yeah, Dave yeah. put together <laughs> this anthology called Weird Dream Society which is amazing and really cuts to it's it's from a group of writers who who have a, a writers community and do things um, writers group things online, but really uh, some really top people in there. Greg Greg Bossard is part of it, and um, and Sarah and Steve and um, and she really wanted to get at her feelings on weird fiction, which are very similar to mine. So Weird Dream Society, which came out last year, would be another. Um, edited by Julie Day would be another book. Uh, and I always sing the praises of Tanya Liburd, uh, who has not had a collection yet, but is someone uh, writes some really unique stories. She's 
based in Canada um, and um, from Trinidad or family. Uh, so um, I always take a point to recommend her. Uh, is that enough? Um, I mean, obviously. Oh, I yeah, yeah. No, I was just curious. I have so many authors that I, I love um, that I, uh, I want to read the, oh, I want to read the Revolution um, Will Be Weird, the other anthology from um, Broken Eye Books. Could I love that concept? Are you familiar with uh, Katriana Ward? With, um, uh, she's got a book coming out. It's not out yet. I, I've got the art, but it's amazing. It's called The Last House on Needless Street. No, I'm not and, familiar with it. Like yeah, yeah, it just uh, it comes out. When does it come out? September the 28th. But yeah, people should pre-order that. It's uh, it it's it's very different. <laughs> so the author was uh, uh, Katriana Ward. K A T R I O N A. Well, the last name is Ward. W A R D. Great. So, um, oh, uh, Chronister is in, I read last year. Um, I'm sorry, the Preke Chronister. I think she did she get an SJA nomination for Thin Places, her collection, or did she get a W? Um, well, and she she got a um, it's, it's from um, Undertow, and it's really great. She's the first person I interviewed in the show who shares my love of Isaac Dennison, so I had to uh, um, I had to connect with her, but her stories are very much um tales in the sense that uh, that um Isaac Dennison's stories are but yeah I say I'm looking at the clock at uh, the outer dark we um because of everything going on with with me um um Scott's been uh not doing the show for for a while he's been on sabbatical because of um that's Scott Nicolay um the founder of the outer dark because he's finishing his dissertation and translating the works of Jean Ray and editing a book oh on yeah those John genre Keith books Howard, they are amazing. And it's and going through graduate school. So it's just been hard to keep up with the outer dark. So I basically have been doing all the shows and I was keeping up with it somewhat. Um, but then just in June, I um when my mom was in the middle of that move, I just really had to concentrate on getting stuff in. And then in the middle of summer, I just didn't feel like it was the right time to come back. So I think we're going to come back sometime in the next few weeks. Um, this is horror needed a little break too. So that's yeah. that kind There's of. There's only awesome. so much you can do on you and you, you know, your, your listeners will be there when you come back. Yeah, I think we will come back. I'm not sure exactly what week yet, but we'll come back either sometime between mid-August to early September, and then we're going to be on pretty regularly. We'll either be on bi-weekly or, or every week, depending on what I can do, because we'll be announcing the Symposium 2022 dates. Um, so that's, that's going to be a big deal, and I need, to, I need to be steady, and we'll be promoting that a lot. Um, for anyone who would like to come, there will be some memberships available people who bought memberships to the previous one that we that went virtual will have precedence, but there will be spots. Um, we're we're, we're going to make sure that there are spots that are available for people. And I will be okay. reaching out to people who want to be guests. You know, I'll be reaching out soon uh, for program participants, but I haven't uh, started that process. But, uh, you know, any day, any week, very soon. Well, you do so much and, um, you know, you're taking care of your mother too. And um, you, you, you seem like you have a lot of energy. I admire everything that you've been doing these past few years. So I really do. Well, thank um, you. I admire all that you do. I mean, you have uh, your own challenges with, with health challenges and with and raising a family and doing Lovecraft easy. And you got to love to do something like this. You really have to love it. And yeah, you do. I think, I mean, there are times when we've talked, Scott and I have just talked about well, we just stay out of dark too much. And then somebody says to us, oh, how much it means to them. And with the symposium, people really have been saying that to me. Um, that's a that community. We have a lot of times it's uh, the, the, a lot of time. It's the most gratifying thing about it is, um, and I'm sure you're, you know, exactly what I'm talking about is you had no idea this person was even listening, mm -hmm. you know, and they're like, oh, this means a lot to me. And you know, while they're telling you this, they're introducing themselves. I've been listening for years and you never knew it. You know, it's, it's just, it's so nice. And that's why you keep going. One of the reasons you keep going. Mm -hmm. So, 
So anyway, uh, Pete, folks, please pick up uh, Sleeping with the Enemy by Anya Martin. Sleeping with the Monster. Sleeping with the Monster. I <laughs> God, Julia Roberts popped into my head for a second there. Uh, Julia Roberts is not in this book. <laughs> I don't think she's... Sleeping with the Monster, yes. I'm sorry. Uh, by Anya Martin. And um, the, the other one is... Uh, why am I blanking on this? Cootie title shot required. Where this is like a Sunday, I right? Guess. Cootie shot uh, required. Um, and I could say my novella Grass is coming has been came out in Spain and it's going to be out in Czech, the Czech Republic, um, later this year. So, um, all right. Well, I know you got to go, but thanks for spending an hour with us today. Oh, it was so much fun. I hate to go actually. <laughs> I never want to like sit and listen to the next part, but I have not seen the last two episodes of Loki, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we've got a ways before we get to Loki, but yes, it, it's, a, it's a fun series. So, well, thank so. you so much for having me on the show. I hope I, if we didn't go over, um, no, not at all. We're pretty loose with the time on this program. So, so thanks I for really being here. It. And, um, um, I want to thank you, and it was so great seeing everybody. And, and I'm really sorry to leave. Uh, well, I will tune into the whole episode, I'll, I'll watch it in the next day or two. Okay, sounds good. Uh, and now we're going to talk to James Chambers. Thanks, Anya. Um, tell Scott I said hi. I will. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Hey, hey James. James. James, I didn't realize you were the James Chambers who did all that work for Moon Still. Yes. <laughs> that, that's that's gu guilty, I've, guilty I've, as charged. I've read at least one adventure story by you. Oh, terrific. I had a lot of fun writing that story. Yeah. I remember that one uh, with, the, with the horseshoe crabs. That was and a, Kolchak. Yes. Kolchak is, is a blast to write. I had, a, I had a long path with Moonstone before I got to actually write Kolchak for them. Wow. Um, so you have an anthology out called Under Twin Suns, Alternate Histories of the Yellow Sign, edited by James Chambers. Yes. So... I, I know the partial answer to this question, but I stopped you because I wanted to ask you to explain the rest to me on air. Uh, your last name, as you may know, is Chambers. So what I asked was, <laughs> is this a happy coincidence or did you get into Robert W. Chambers because you're like, my name's Chambers, his name is Chambers. Let me check this guy out. Well, it definitely drew my attention to him and a lot of the weird fiction and, and horror fiction that I read um, when I discovered the genre and started digging into it. I just kind of followed the threads. This author mentioned to these authors and these authors mentioned these authors. And there were several who mentioned Arthur Mock and Robert W. Chambers and a few others. And of course I saw Chambers and thought, oh, I should, I should find out more about this guy. And so that, um, definitely sort of rose chambers to the top of the list to, okay, I should go read these stories and find out, you know, who is this person? Is there any, any possibility I'm actually connected to Robert W. Chambers? The, the King and Yellow mythos. Um, what, what fascinates you about it? The, you know, whatever you want to call it, Karkotha mythos, King and Yellow mythos. What, what fascinates uh, you about it enough to, to enjoy the stories and then to edit an anthology of stories based on it? I, th I think to, to some extent, it's how little Chambers actually wrote of those things. He, he, he really did not provide a, a sort of fully formed mythos in, in the sense uh, to compare him briefly to, to Lovecraft in the sense that there is sort of this panoply of entities and ideas, um, it was very much on the fringes and of his stories. And it comes in, it's very important to the stories where it's, it's the focus, but it doesn't, you, you read the stories and you don't really come out of it understanding the big picture any better than when you started. You're just getting these glimpses of something truly strange otherworldly um inhuman in the sense that you know it affects your your 
your mental state to encounter these things. And I just love the, the notion of there having such a, an open slate to play with. And yet, if you read closely enough, there are sort of rules and principles that you have to stick to for something to really fit into that mythos. Um, Pete, you, re you recently recommended a book to me, the title escapes me, remind me, and we interviewed the author about a year ago. Um, what was that again? Uh, Memento Mori. Memento Mori, the Fathomless Shadows, something like that? Something like that, yeah. And uh, the author's name was? Uh, hold Bryant. on. Yeah. What, what is wrong with my memory today? I don't know. Well, uh, I was going to ask and then flip back over to, to Jim. But I was going to ask you or Rick or Matt. Um, I'm very familiar with the, uh, you know, uh, Carcosa mythos, whatever you want to call it. But you three, actually, I think everybody here on this panel now is more of an expert on this than me. And I wonder if, if Pete or Rick or Matt, if you guys want to maybe for the person out there who is like, okay, wh what is this really? I've heard of it, but what is this? What is this about? What does this entail? Do you want to give okay. a brief explanation? Yeah, briefly. Okay. So first of all, this doesn't really have anything to do with Lovecraft. Um, Lovecraft liked what he read and took a few of the names. Uh, but ba Brian Hauser. But, yeah, but Derleth was the guy who took the name Hastur and made it a full-fledged mythos entity, the half-brother of Cthulhu, uh, an earth elemental, perhaps air elemental, who knows, which sort of made this all get gummed together. And then which you have all the, all the authors who love to write in Lovecraftian uh, stories. They also enjoy writing in the King and Yellow stories. So King and Yellow stories got put in a lodge of Lovecraft anthologies just because it was the same writers and Derleth had showed the way. But the actual King and Yellow mythos consists of four <laughs> weird stories by Chambers that were written in a single collection called The King in Yellow. And they weren't even the biggest part of that book. Right. But uh, there's like the court of the dragon, uh, the repair of reputations. Um, I'm going to forget blank on the other name. Yes. Yeah. So what you want to do, if you want to yes. start, we won't even go into how he got the name, took the name Hastur from a different source, but read those four stories and then read Joe Pulver. <laughs> exactly. Now I have a very good friend who's a very, very generous guy. Um, who sent me this edition of the King in Yellow um, stories illustrated. Um, thank you, Matthew Carpenter. And if, if you can get your hands on this, this is the way to read it, man. This That's is awesome. the annotated edition. Yes, the annotated the, edition. The annotations are by Kenneth Height, who's mm -hmm. a really smart guy. So they're really good annotations. And it was published by the same publishing company that puts out Delta Green. Yep. Here's uh, some. Here's some I, more. It might have been Arc Dream Publishing. I forget. Uh, because the authors who wrote in the um, Delta Green milieu loved Chambers also. But if you could get that, it's great. But I think all four stories are available for free online. Yes. Uh, yeah. If you if, are uh, alternatively, yes. alternatively, you can just go on the internet and read them. But this is pretty cool. It's even more cool because I didn't have to spend my money on it. Rick had an, uh, excuse me, Matt had an extra copy, and I think you were going to give it as a prize, and I was like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> hint. <laughs> so anyway, anything else, Matt, that you wanted to say? Uh, no, just if you want to read the actual King and Yellow Mythos, consider it separate from Lovecraft. You don't have to believe what Derleth wrote. Just read those four stories. I got to tell you, I read The Repair of Reputations. I don't know. I was 14, 15 years old. Frickin' blew me away. Still does. Every time I read that story, it just messes with my mind. By the way, it was Brian Hauser, Pete, 
Yes. Uh, Brian, yep. if you're watching, I interviewed you and I couldn't remember your name, but you're later. I'm sorry. Scott, thank you for pointing out that I've been sick. Um, yeah, that is part of it. But very, very good novel. Uh, Memento Mori by Brian Hauser, H-A-U-S-E-R. But we're here to talk about Under Twin Sons. But, you know, after you read that book, uh, you know, one of the big selling points of Under Twin Sons is I, I, I have a friend, Joe Pulver, who is no longer with us. Love the hell out of this guy. And there is a previously unpublished novella by Joseph S. Pulver Sr. Right, James? That's correct. Yes, it's called Less Light. Oh, yeah. that's a playoff of James Blish's More Light. Yes. <laughs> it's and sort of his version. It's sort of Joe's version of what the King of Yellow might have been as a play. You know, for those... Yeah. For those who don't know, Joe was basically Mr. King in Yellow. Matt wasn't wrong when he said, read those four stories, then read Joe Pulver. Uh, of course, read Under Twin Sons. Um, I want to get to the list of authors. I wanted to mention Joe first, for obvious reasons. Um, before I do, Alternate Histories of the Yellow Sign. Now, talk about that subtitle for a minute, Jim. Well, the the initial idea was to blend stories set in the, the the king in yellow mythos with alternate history stories and sort of like and that was inspired by the repair of reputations which is just a fantastic piece of uh i can't say alternate history exactly because it was when it was written it was set in the future so it was set about 25 it's years in the future dystopian. yeah it's a piece of dystopian fiction yeah but but reading it today it's all it reads almost like an alternate history because it's so well uh, so much of it is so well realized and you, you can from personally I, I really see that version of New York City in 1920 I think it was come, come, coming to life in that story and it sticks with me uh, and I loved just that idea of what does the world look like with this this madness loose in in society and and um, that uh, inspired me actually to write a story called uh, The Last Chamber of Earthly Delights, which was a king in yellow story I wrote for uh, my short story collection on the night border. And it's um, the, the protagonist in that is one of the workers who runs the government lethal chambers uh, that are mentioned in The Repair of Reputations. And I, I sort of took the idea of, well, I'm going to jump ahead a few years and what does New York City of that era look like? having these you know these elements as part of the landscape and from there i just started to wonder well what would other authors do with this concept you know this this basic premise of reading uh, and we we st stuck to the repair of reputations and the yellow sign those are the two stories that i uh, asked all of the contributors to read and to kind of look at uh, for inspiration for source material uh, the other two stories in the Court of the Dragon and the Mask have uh, are sort of less connected to the, the core King and Yellow mythos. And so I wanted to work with those two primarily and basically said to everyone, imagine a world uh, where these are factors in how society is developed. You can do any time period uh, from the con you know something contemporaneous with the repair of reputations up to more or less the present. And that's where we, we went. Uh, and I was really surprised at a lot of the choices. Uh, some, some really wonderful looks uh, at history, at historical eras through this lens uh, came in. And so it was always part of the, the DNA of the anthology was to have this, this history element to it, this alternate history element to it. And that was really inspired by the repair of reputations. It was interesting that after a piece of poetry by Ann Schrader, it was a story by Lisa Morton, which tells where Robert W. Chambers is the character. And we have a story by Don Langan, where Joe Pulver is the character. Yes. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, I, uh, I, I thought Lisa's story was, was a wonderful opening for the anthology because for those people who maybe had not read the source material and I do write in the introduction you know 
go read these two stories. They're on the internet. You can find them easily. Uh, you don't, you don't need to read them to read the anthology, but it does help. You'll get a little more out of it. And I thought Lisa's story gave you sort of a crash course in the King and Yellow stories. Um, and it was interesting to bring Chambers in as a character. And I especially liked in that story, how she connected, um, connected the whole thing to um, an inhabitant in Carcosa by Ambrose Bierce, uh, which was, you know, just a nice um, tie to probably what, what was probably one of Chambers inspirations uh, to some extent for those stories. Uh, and then John Langan um, turned in that story Helioforge with Joe Pulver as, as the protagonist, essentially. And uh, that I had no idea what was John, what John was going to do. Um, and it just landed and I loved that, loved the story. And I think it, it's an interesting piece because it does go back a little bit to the discussion that you were having, Mike, with Anya about what is weird fiction. And I think Helioforge is a great weird tale, but there's not a lot of horror in it. There's not a lot of dread. There's not a lot of fear. It, it's it's um, a different type of weird story. And uh, John did a beautiful job with it. And was that the first story you received? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little joke. You, right. you, know, you knew you were going there, Mike. You knew it. I, sh I yeah. should say yes. I, I waited till I got John's story and then made everyone else rush. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No. I, I already know it was the last story you got, not counting Joe's, right. which was being edited some more. But uh, no, I, I, I like to give john a lot of shit but as i told you when we did the video test i always say that if, if even knowing you may probably wait for a john langan story always always know that it's very much worth the wait so he, he's a great writer yeah absolutely and this one certainly was worth the wait um guys i don't want to ask all the questions here you guys want to talk <laughs> about this no with Jim, a little bit? No? There's. Uh, we've got, um, I don't know how many of the total of stories here, but quite a uh, lot of different authors. Uh, John Langan, Sarah Reed, Karen Warren, skipping ahead, uh, Greg Chapman, of course, Ann Schwader. Um, not going to name them all, but uh, uh, Linda Addison, Tim Wagoner. Um, Linda Addison, really? Wow. Yeah, Linda Addison's in here. Um, so, yeah. Uh, quite a diverse list of writers. Um, this has been out, what, about just a few weeks now, right? Yeah, probably just about a month. Yeah, it's available in print. It's also available on Kindle. And for those of you who have, excuse me, who have Kindle Unlimited, it's available on Kindle Unlimited. So, um so pick it up yeah read it um by the way i loved your introduction uh about you know no mask no mask and tying that into uh to the pandemic so i cat uh, is watching life she knows what i'm gonna say and then i hope i get this exactly right um but so i made a little joke on i think it was facebook about a year ago a little over a year ago and you know people were like like we're not gonna wear masks you know stuff like that and so i i'm sure i wasn't the only person who did this but i wrote you know no mask no mask you know how horrifying it is or something like that and i think her phone because her vision is somewhat limited her phone reads things off to her and it read this off to her in the middle of the night you know so and you know she was married to joe and then all of a sudden she hears this no mask coming out in the middle of the night so it really freaked her out <laughs> i could certainly see that being alarming <laughs> yeah yeah so um we we did a uh just i think about a week ago week and a half ago we did a reading in brooklyn which, uh, which is where Chambers was born. And uh, I, I have, for the life of me, not been able to figure out exactly where in Brooklyn he was born. But as part of a, a rooftop reading series at an ice cream shop called Ample Hills Creamery, of all places, we did an Under Twin Suns reading. And 
I read that bit about no mask uh, from the introduction as the opening for the reading, and I was surprised, but everyone laughed. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and th the gist of it was when I started work on the book in 2019, no one had any idea that by the spring of uh, 2020, 2021, well, earlier this year when I was writing the introduction, that no mask would have a whole new level of meaning. Yeah. So you're working on the book and uh, you it's, it's published by Hippocampus Press, uh, Derek Hussey. And I think you told me you said something to Derek about, well, we better get going on a cover or something like that. And he said, oh, the cover has been done for months, which, you know, if, if you look behind me, you know, you can see that wonderful, let me try to go here. You can see that wonderful cover there. Um, by, by Aaron Alfrey. Yes. So it, it's got a, yeah. Yeah, I think when, when we first started work on the, on the anthology, Derek said something about I might, you know, he thought he might ask Aaron Alfrey about the cover and i didn't think any more of it until we were you know it was getting to the point where we we're turning over the manuscript and i uh, emailed derek and said have you had any thoughts about the cover yet and he he wrote back with a with a file attachment and said oh yeah, the cover's been done for months here it is and and i opened this file to get this just absolutely spectacular uh amazingly macabre wraparound cover by aaron alfrey which um is now my my computer desktop screen because I see something new in it almost every time I look at it. There's so much detail in that cover. It's really a beautiful piece of art um, and very well suited to the book, I think. But uh, we, so that, that was a nice surprise. And uh, so far, everyone has been very complimentary about the cover, which is nice. Um, One thing uh, I liked yes. about the book was uh, due to the Call of Cthulhu uh, role-playing game has been a standard yellow sign that has been adapted and you didn't you had a story in there that didn't go with that it came up with a more logical design of the yellow sign which shame has never really fully described yeah i i left it up to the authors to the contributors uh we didn't have i didn't feel there was a need for consistency on that level because i'd rather see their vision uh for what what that would look like and let it let them fit it into their particular world influenced by the yellow sign. Um, Jim and Pete and whoever else wants to talk about this, Rick, Matt, um, talk about Carcosa for a minute. So someone's interested in the King and Yellow mythos and they're, 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 they say to you guys, Okay, so what is this Carcosa place? I mean, twin suns, black stars, uh, ruled by the king in yellow. Um, what, what's your response? Is there an adequate response? Is it just too mysterious of a place to even know more than that? Well, briefly, it's a city somewhere in outer space. They had all the barren and the high aids. And um, it's vaguely described as having black towers and being where black stars hang. There are two suns and multiple moons. We don't exactly know how many moons. And it's ruled by a mysterious figure in, in a tattered yellow robe called the King in Yellow, who is sometimes comes off as a uh, cosmic version of the devil, but is also somewhat a cosmic version of God too at the same time. I, I sort of view it like um, it, it's a place of, um, there has been a great dynasty there, there has been a kingdom, and you get this sense that if any of that still exists, it's either dilapidated or very yeah. much, uh, near the end of days, like in Carcosa, where shadows gather, entropy is gathering towards end of something. And somehow or another, people from Earth are able to somehow sometimes walk the streets of Carcosa. And if they do, seldom do they ever come back. If they come back, 
um, they often have an overwhelming sense of hopelessness. It makes me think a little bit of in uh, one of the um, uh, uh, Narnia books, the origin book, where Narnia is created and everything, and the, and the planet where they find the White Witch, I think it is. Uh, it's an old world where it's been abandoned and it's dilapidated and everything. And it, it sometimes makes me think of that. Um, it, but my question, Rick, is it in outer space or is it, why is it the feeling it was another dimension? Well, like, I, I would say, well, since, you, since they mentioned constellations, you would say it's, you say it's in outer space. Okay. Yeah. So, but, but originally when Ambrose Beers created a city called Closa, it was a sort of a, a, a ghost town in Arabia in which uh, uh, literally uh, uh, a former inhabitant goes is haunting the place. And what Chambers is, he doesn't say the ghost in Carcosa, but he has that poem that begins the repair of reputation, Casilda's song. And Casilda who's singing this says her voice is dead, which implies that she is some sort of ghost. Jim, what was the genesis of this book? What, what, what was the tipping point? Did some, you know, you're like, I, I just, I really want to do a King and Yellow anthology. How did this come about? I've been knocking around uh, anthology ideas for a while, and um, I have, I have a handful of anthology ideas that, despite my best efforts, I, I cannot kill uh, or make go <laughs> away. And so I decided, all right, well, I better start you know, doing some of these. And this one seemed like a great place uh, at the time. I uh, was, was reading a lot of Chambers, uh, had written the story I mentioned for On the Night Border and was looking for a vehicle to do something a little bit um, different in, in terms of weird fiction or cosmic horror. And I thought this would be an interesting approach. And so that really just, uh, I, I developed a proposal for this and a second anthology and started talking to uh, Derek Hussey at Hippocampus Press about them. And we were just kind of going back and forth about the idea, the viability, what it would look like, what the shape would be. And uh, then we were chatting at Necronomicon. I think it must have been Necronomicon 2019. And uh, kind of firm things up, just, uh, you know, talking through what it could be and who some of the authors might be. Uh, and once Derek said, let's do it, um, that was, you know, everything was full steam ahead. And I started reaching out to authors. I had, so, you know, I had a list of authors in mind specifically for the, the project that I knew I wanted to reach out to. Um, and a lot of them, you know, very fortunately for me, a lot of them contributed to the book. Uh, there were a few that I was hoping would, would be able to contribute who didn't, but that's how it goes with any anthology. Right. Uh, sometimes a, a theme doesn't click or somebody's just not available. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. You said one thing there that just really caught my ear, a second anthology. Yeah. <laughs> What's that one? Is it in the works too? Uh, it's not, not in the works, but it hasn't been given it's the not, green, not green light works. anywhere yeah <laughs> I, I can't say too much about that one yet except that it um it would not be a chambers related anthology but it would be related to another classic of weird fiction and horror fiction so uh, hopefully i'll be able to to give you some details uh sooner rather than later <laughs> Did you have to shop this around or did you just basically go to Derek and you guys talked about it? And he said, you know, after a while, he said, let's do it. Yeah. Hippocampus Press was the first publisher I thought of for it because it seemed like a good fit there. And uh, as it yeah. turned out, they they happened to be prepping um, a Chambers volume, which was recently published called The Harbor Master and Other Stories. Oh, um, yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that so you can also get all of the the, the core 
King and Yellow stories in that book, along with a selection of other weird fiction from Chambers. And so Derek thought that made a nice pair. And uh, we just kind of went from there. Um, so I was very happy that it, it worked out at Hippocampus. Uh, this is this is the second anthology I've edited that they've published. I co-edited an anthology called A New York State of Fright uh, several years back. And that was a fundraising anthology, sort of a charity anthology for a local New York group called Girls Right Now that paired professional publishing mentors with uh, at-risk teen girls interested in writing. And we did a book of New York horror stories by New York authors, and it was published by a, a New York horror independent press, Hippocampus Press. Um, so that had kind of set uh, the stage for, for me to approach Derek with this book because um, I had such a great time working with Hippocampus Press the first time around and the second yeah. time around too. Yeah, you're right. This is definitely worth picking up. Um, yes. It came out recently too, The Harbor Master and Other Stories, Best Weird, Cham uh, excuse me, West Best Weird Stories of Robert W. Chambers. And it's the same cover artist, yes. uh, Aaron Alfred. So great, wonderful cover. So, yeah, very creepy. So yeah. Har Harbor Master is an influence on the Shadow of Weird as well. Even though it's somewhat, it's somewhat a comedic story. Uh, I, I think again, it's worth pointing out that Mr. King and Yellow himself, Joe Porver, has a previously unpublished, not just short story, but novella, in uh, Under Twin Suns. So you know, there's a lot of great authors in this book, but that, that's reason alone to pick this up. Um, just to explain that story a, a little better. Yes. It, it, we, I don't think we, we, we mentioned all this. The King in Yellow is a fictional play mm -hmm. in these stories. And you only get excerpts from it. And an author named James Bliss wrote a story called More Light, where he printed a version of the play, at least his, what he imagined it would be. I, I, and, I just, it, it, I really dislike it. He shouldn't have done it. Well, Joe published not the whole play, but like excerpts in this one more than I think he's did in any other story. So we, it was sort of his version of what the play more likely was going to be. That's why it's called Less Light. Uh, the other thing about Joe, for those who don't know, is he uh, had a real pet peeve about people who um, included the uh the carcosa or king and yellow mythos with the lovecraft mythos um to him they were they were maybe related but very separate things you know so well, that, um, that was one of my my hopes with the anthology uh was to to take another step toward this mythos standing on its own separating from the lovecraft connection and uh, so that was, you know, something that I was not looking for, anything that sort of tied that in to Lovecraft. And uh, I think Joe probably did more than anybody to to kind of put the King and Yellow mythos, the Carcosa mythos out in the in the limelight on its own as its own thing. Uh, yeah, I, I would agree. So we have a request, uh, Jim, for what is the picture behind you? To your right and what are the statues on your bookshelf back there oh okay uh behind me to my right is a really cool poster uh that is every cover of action comics from number one to 1000 oh uh, wow printed at like postage stamp size <laughs> wow nice it's a, it's a fun thing and you know if you get up close enough you can actually see a fair amount of detail uh on my bookshelf, let's see, I've got a couple of gargoyles. Um, and the Funko Pop is the Spectre from DC Comics. <laughs> and uh, let's see, I wanted to ask you about uh, Devil in the Green. Um, I don't know anything about this, um, but the description really... Um, really caught my eye there i won't read the whole thing but it just starts off with there are creatures lurking in our world obscure creatures long relegated to myth and legend they have been sighted by a lucky or unlucky few 
Some have even been photographed, but their existence remains unproven and unrecognized by the scientific community. Uh, these creatures long thought gone have somehow survived creatures from our nightmares haunting the dark places. Um, talk about this novella for a minute. Sure. It, it's part of a series, uh, System Paradoxa, that the publisher East Beck Books created uh, in collaboration with a cryptozoological mystery box, subscription mystery box, Cryptid Crates. And uh, if, you, if you're familiar with the concept of a mystery box, you subscribe and once a month yeah. they send you a box of goodies, um, cool stuff, stuff that you can't get anywhere else. And so they decided that they wanted to include some books in the, the series. And so the publisher created this System Paradox series. Though. So it's all based on cryptids and cryptozoology. And we had each author had to pick some cryptids to deal with uh, and to write about. And so for Devil in the Green, I selected the Montauk monster, uh, which takes, uh, which is um, kind of an odd, lesser known cryptid. I think its name is better known than in any of the details. It, it doesn't go back that far. It only dates back to about 2008. Uh, but it has somehow become connected with the Montauk project, which is the, um, the conspiracy theory about government experiments being done at the former camp, uh, military base Camp Hero out in Montauk on Long Island that was part of the inspiration for Stranger Things. And uh, I jumped in and wrote this novella about um, a young photographer, photojournalist character, and a, uh, a biology professor from a Brooklyn school who wind up investigating uh, the possibility that somebody out in Montauk actually has the, the remains of the true mon Montauk monster, which uh, according to the Montauk monster legend uh, were taken away and then vanished. Uh, somebody collected them to keep and they were never seen again. Uh, and the Montauk monster itself, there's a photo um, easily found online. It's uh, it was a, some kind of carcass that washed up on Dune Plains beach. Yep, I remember uh, it. Yeah. Around uh, summer 2008 and kind of went viral when it was, uh, the picture was shared by BuzzFeed and it's this really bizarre looking carcass. It does have sort of a prehistoric shape to its head and teeth, but it's also uh, pretty much bare of any fur or hair. So chances are it was just some, some kind of dog, crat, raccoon or other similar creature. Um, but that, you know, that doesn't stop stories from, from growing. And so I had some fun uh, digging into that tying everything into a sort of a bigger story that involves uh, the Montauk Project, Men in Black, and possibly Bigfoot. Well, um, Under Twin Suns is a really, uh, honestly, a really quality book. And if you're a Kindle person, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, the print edition is just so beautiful. Uh, if you want to get it on Kindle, though, Kindle Unlimited, um, you can certainly do that. Um, your story, um, uh, The Devil in the Green by James Chambers, um, that's available in print and Kindle, and it's only two ninety nine dollars on Kindle for you Kindle folks out there. So, you know, pick that up. Um, yeah, thanks for talking with us, James. Is there anything that maybe I should have asked that I forgot to ask or anything else that you want to mention? No, I, th I think we covered a lot. Thank you so much for having me on and for talking about Under Twin Suns. I'm, I'm really excited for people to read it. Uh, it uh, the book came together in a way that exceeded my expectations, exceeded my hopes. And I think Hippocampus Press did a wonderful job publishing it. So I'm just hoping uh, readers will enjoy it. It's It's got great views, but only three so far on Amazon. And this is so important. Um, folks, if you read Under Twin Suns and you like it, um, not only did the writers work hard on an anthology, but so did the publisher and so did the editor. Um, and, um, you know, so that, see, nobody gets rich off an anthology, and this may be your, your uh, huge, huge press, but, you know, uh, 
when they see these reviews and someone else who loves the book, that's a real shot in the arm. So after you read the book, uh, please do that. But I mean, Goodreads is important and Amazon is important. Um, so many people, they'll go to Amazon and they'll make a, a kind of a snap decision based on the reviews, you know, uh, of a book. So it is very important. Um, I, I see, and I've done it myself, many people in a, in a, in a bookstore thinking about picking up a book and they'll pull up Amazon real quick and see what the reviews are like on Amazon for this book. And then they'll be like, ah, good reviews. Yep. I'm I'm buying it. So yeah. Yeah. Please do that. Um, so yeah. Thanks, Jim. Um, so under twin sons, alternate histories of the yellow sign edited by James Chambers. So, um, so yeah. And again, worth, worth it for worth the price, worth the entry price alone is the previously unpublished novella by Joe Porter. Um, so, yeah, and that, that it, was just to, to say quickly, it was, I was yes. honored that we were, we were, we had the opportunity to include that. Um, it was something that when the, the project started, uh, Joe was still with us and Derek and I had said, maybe we can, if not get a story, maybe at least get a blurb or a forward or something from Joe to, to support the project. And, uh, it was um, a terrible loss when Joe passed away, uh, but I was really uh, just honored and thrilled that we were able to include that novella. And it, it's a powerful piece. It really is uh, beautifully written. And it was a challenge to edit. Uh, if you've read Joe Poehler's work, it's oh, yeah. idiosyncratic it, and stylized. He is, he is a challenge to edit. Yes. <laughs> yes. And uh, so I think, I think, um, I think we, we did it and uh, you know very, and that's a compliment by the way for anyone yes. who thinks oh he might we just denigrated joe no no it's a challenge to edit because it's amazing and he it's writes so, so differently yes yes um so yeah yeah uh all right well thanks james are you going to stick around for a few more minutes yeah happy to until you start uh, talking about loki i haven't seen loki. right right <laughs> all right pete i saw on social media and i'm quoting what? now you wrote, I've talked about Horror Express as a version of the thing, but what about as an inspiration for Prince of Darkness? Yeah. I can't stay too long, but I, I wanted to cover that before, and a couple of other things before we got to Loki. Right, I really so, don't... Go ahead. I was going to say, I really don't see too much of Prince of Darkness, but they're right me. So, both... Gather uh, round for a... Both <laughs> Horror Express and Prince of Darkness deal with a, a creature that is not entirely organic. It's a, you know, uh, Horror Express talks about it is an actually, he's an actually an energy being from another galaxy that has come down to earth millions of years ago and is, is um, working his way through our history his very existence causes a crisis of faith in Horror Express with the priest. Okay, that's, that's this connection. Which also happens in the Prince of Darkness, which you know, it's, that's one of the actually the one of the core fundamental themes of the Prince of Darkness is is a, is a crisis of faith, and there's this weird power that both creatures have to sort of infect their victims and create slaves. So I was watching this, I, I literally watched it again last night and, and this all came to me. And it's like, yes, it's a really good version of who goes there, but it's also like an early shot at doing Prince of Darkness. And, you know, John Carpenter is, you know, big for the thing and for prince of darkness so yeah it just i, I looked at it and said yeah let's put this out in the world yeah. it's an interesting thought you got a good point so and then also like the, the the at the end it's the scientists who survive um but they're both haunted by what they've done so 
Thanks for bringing that up, Mike. I just, you know, put me on the spot. I appreciate that. I didn't. You notice I didn't warn you that this was. You didn't warn me at all. No. But you know, it's it's one of the things I'm trying to do is go back and watch films I've watched before with new eyes and make connections that I wouldn't have made as my knowledge expands. Well, have you seen a movie called 616 Wilford Lane? I have not. I watched Sun instead. How how was Sun? Sun was totally predictable and something I've seen before. But it was well acted and well produced. I know you like to watch terrible movies, but do not watch (laughs) 616 Wilford Lane. We started it last night. I finally talked my wife into watching a scary movie with me. And you picked that? And I picked a piece of shit, apparently. So we have stopped you, it after about 25 minutes. Have you watched Homebound? Homebound? Homebound. Doesn't ring a bell. I, I, it's Australian. And it's about a young woman who um, gets sent home on house arrest. And begins to believe that her house is haunted. I definitely have not seen that and is it good it's really quite entertaining well next up is blood red sky who's seen blood red sky i've seen blood red sky aka I, vampires I like, on a plane i like to think of it as uh die hard on a plane with vampires yes uh did you like it i thought it was a good popcorn film yeah um, you know it's it, uh it, it it started off well, and then it went a couple of directions I didn't particularly care for, but it, it was okay. It was good. It's worth a watch. It's worth watching, uh, yes. yes. Uh, unlike 616 Wilford Lane, it's worth a watch. <laughs> so did you guys see it? Matt, Rick, Jim? No. Uh, no. On my list of potential movies I might see sometime eventually, sooner or later maybe. Okay. By the way, next week we're, we're having the producers of 616 Wilford Lane on the show. The yeah. hell we are. <laughs> Uh, Richard Chismar actually next week uh, we're uh, we're going to talk about Chasing the Boogeyman which comes out on the 17th so really good really good metafiction by R- Richard Chismar <laughs> so um, and uh, just just you know look that up on Amazon for anyone who's interested but it's it's a really good book um what's next what was i going to talk about um what if you want to talk about what if and then we'll talk about loki somebody wanted to talk about what if i just mentioned what if you just mentioned what if yeah i mean that's going to be in two weeks the animated uh marvel series where most of the voices are going to be done nearly all the voices are going to be done by the original movie actors of all the universe versions of the Marvel movies. So it starts off with what if Peggy Carter became a super soldier? When does this come out? Two weeks. Uh, two weeks. Okay. Uh, one more thing before we go to Loki. Um, on this show, as everyone knows who's watched the show for a while, one of the things that Pete likes to do is to show off his really rare books and really really cool books so Mm -hmm. this is the only time in my life i'd probably be able to one-up pete rollick and wait wait wait, let's see and here it is this is a brand new edition of the night country by Stuart onan one of my favorite books nice and slip cover yep and there's the what? This is this is put out by the same people who did that limited edition of Revival. The oh, is press. it? Yeah. Is it? Uh, anyway, um, it's also illustrated. There's one illustration. This is a very, you know, here's the thing about Night Country. I'm in the Urbandale Library in Des Moines about, I don't know, probably a year after the book came out. And I see the Night Country in hardcover. It's, it's got more or less a black cover. I think hmm. it gradually draws me in because the title of the night country 
I'm like, oh, I like that title. Um, and then um, I open it up and it says for Ray Bradbury. Mm-hmm. You know, I started on that for, for Ray Bradbury. I'm like, oh, okay, I keep getting hooked on this. And then it, it talks about, it's set on Halloween and it's about um, the previous Halloween in this small town uh, where these uh, small suburb town, I should say, uh, where these kids, the previous Halloween, um, had gotten a car wreck. And three of them died. One of them suffered brain damage. And one of them basically survived without a scratch. Um, I'll just read a little bit of the, the inside cover. Uh, a strange and unsettling ghost story. The night country creeps through the leaf-strewn streets and quiet cul-de-sacs of a bedroom community reaching into the desperately connected yet isolated lives of three people changed forever by the accident. Um, And then it's, am I going to say his name right? Francois Villancourt does the illustrations in this book. Okay. Uh, Here's, uh, you see this at the beginning of each chapter. Um, it's got a new introduction by Stuart Onan. It's got, um, it, here's a Theodore Wiesner, and this was in the original too. Is it possible to feel love for a side street without sidewalks, for parked cars and wooden houses? Um, now, I, I, I will say before I continue that even if you never get this, this is a limited edition. There is going to be um, more editions of, I think, similar to this, that are that are unsigned but still very nice editions. Even if you only pick up, you know, what's been out there since 2007 or or whatever, this is if you like Ray Bradbury, if you like Quiet Ghost Stories, if you like Halloween, this is just this book is dripping with it, you know, uh, and it's got one of the best beginnings of a book ever. Um, I've read this on the show before, um, and I won't bore you guys with it again, but it's basically, gosh, I don't even know how to describe this. Read the first chapter of this and you'll be hooked. And then the other interesting thing about this is each chapter, Stuart, like here's chapter one, it's called Something Wicked. All right, what, what does that remind you of? Besides Shakespeare. And then chapter two, I Know What You Did. So, I mean, you're probably seeing a pattern here, right? Here's some more illustrations. Um, Next chapter is, uh, what's the name of the next chapter? Get to the next chapter. Um, So one long chapter. Oh, next chapter is called uh, Dawn of the Dead, unless I skipped a chapter. So movie title horror movie titles or partial horror movie titles for the um chapter titles it's signed by stewart it's signed by the illustrator and it's signed by i don't know who this guy is paul trembly yeah trembly paul trembly um Paul's a good friend and a very kind guy. There are very few people as talented as Paul who are as kind as Paul. Uh, But one of them is Stuart. Stuart sent this to me, and I was just, I'm blown away. He's a really, really nice guy, and I'm going to ask him to come on the show sometime soon. Um, And uh, Paul has an afterword um, to the book. It's just so beautiful. I, I put this on social media, but I wanted to say on my show, uh, thank you to Stuart for sending this to me. Thank you to Paul for um, um, introducing me to Stuart. And um, I, I'm just blown away by how kind both of those guys are. Um, so anyway, that said, I guess we'll kick Jim out because we're going to talk about Loki. and I don't think he wants to hear this. So and Matt's going too. Matt's gotta going go. Too. Okay. Matt's gotta go cook dinner for the family. Yeah. We know what you're we know uh, what you're doing. Right. See you later. Great to see have you, Jim. 
Thank you, man. Right. Thank you, man. Well, and good to see you, Jim. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Take care. Appreciate it. All right. I'm not the Loki expert, although not a Marvel guy, I will say I loved it. Okay, so let's be clear that the What If series is essentially derived you know, from the comic book, but in the terms of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Loki has to exist before you can have What If. He has to allow, he has to create an atmosphere where deviation can exist in the multiverse. Right. And so, don't you think at the end of, uh, well, Multiverse of Madness is coming up. Don't you think at the end of Loki, if Doctor Strange knows what's going on, he's going, what the fuck did you do? Well, you okay, know? so this so, is, go ahead, Rick. I just want to say, I don't think that um, Sylvie, is that a name? Yeah, Sylvie. Yeah, yeah. I don't think you did wrong because the old what, what was existing was a fascist dictatorship where whole realities were being destroyed. That's like uh, the I said to you, peace or freedom choice, right? Right, and freedom is going to mean chaotic wars, unfortunately. Yeah, but that's better than wiping out whole. You know, they're feeding whole realities to a Lovecraftian monster. That was the solution of peace. I don't disagree at all. But it's interesting that Loki disagreed. Well, he hesitated. I, I don't think he did. As he wanted to think it out before they did something. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Like maybe but, they, could, they, they could still end it, but make it less chaotic. Okay, my first question to you two experts is, is Sylvie really a variation of Loki? Or is she someone else? So in the comics, she's someone else. Right. Well, there were two characters that combined. It was Lady Loki, which was Loki in a Sif's body. Right. Which was a totally different version. And then there was Sylvie, who was a, a, a girl trained to be the successor to the Enchantress by Loki. I mean, what kind of balls do these creators have to have to actually create an alligator Loki? Well, no, that's, you know, there was, a, so there was a frog four. I love it. You know, so. If there's not an alligator Loki series, well, I'm going to be disappointed. Out of, uh, alligator Loki would, would, would battle Kangaroo the Conqueror. <laughs> yes. There, there is a Kangaroo the Conqueror in there. There really is? There really he is. Ba he battles Spider-Ham from, uh, oh my God. the, the um, Spider Verse cartoon, yeah, and you know, you know, what is, it's Throg the Frog of Thunder, is is. Uh, uh, can I can I? I think there is a, a version. I think there was an animal version of Loki in the Marvel universe, but he's not an alligator. Yeah. Oh, on the multiverse thing, can I deviate for a second? It, it, is there really uh, into the Spider Verse? movie coming out or is this just a big rumor where all three spider-men are going to be, be in a movie it, no. everybody keeps denying it but you know there's there's lots of contracts and time budgets that all say that this is really going to happen i thought it was like already filmed or something yeah according to Al alfred molina it is yeah hmm. so i mean and this is you know, there was Into the Spider-Verse with um, um, Miles Mor Morales. Yeah, Miles Morales, which was an animated, and there's going to be a sequel to that. Um, but then there's the whole, what is it, No Way Home or whatever this next uh, live action Peter Parker is. With yes. So. Was. Or no, well, if there's going to be a, 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 a multiverse Spider-Man live action with the three that have come before, shouldn't they do a live action Miles Morales in there too? Well, there are people jockeying for that position, but remember that's still not, that Marvel does not own the rights to that character wholly. Oh, I, you know, the other argument would be we're, we're, these, are, these guys are all Peter Parker. Right. Right. And that's a valid argument, actually. And well, listen, just, no, sorry, go ahead, Rick. I was going to say, just as you had, Iron Man get killed off and other people take the title. 
right. it could if this lasts long enough. It, it's part of it's connected to the Marvel universe. Is that Peter Parker die and have uh, Miles Morales assume the mantle as he did in the in the old universe comic book? Right. Not to deviate from Loki again, but just real quick, did you guys see the picture of uh, of uh, Bruce Wayne that was released in the fl- from the upcoming Flashpoint movie? I have. Yeah. I've also seen the picture of um, Michael Keaton, Bruce Wayne. Yes, and uh, what's his name? Ben uh, Affleck. Ben Affleck. Yeah. So, I heard a rumor Ben Affleck's Batman's going to die in this. That would get him out of other movies. That is one. That is the Harrison Ford way. Yes. Yes. So anyway, back to Loki. Back to Loki. So back to Loki. We touched on my 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 stumbling point here is that in. Infinity War, we had this whole scene where Doctor Strange is running the odds. Mm-hmm. You know, he's going through all the possible outcomes. And I'm not sure how that relates to the multiverse. Or well, the how, did, how, did, how, did, how does time work? It, exactly. How does time work in the Marvel Universe? It's a good question. And then in Endgame, you have the Ancient One explaining to Banner why she doesn't want to do things and why she needs it back. And it's all about multiverses. But multiverses caused by deviations. Because you have you have a loop, but it's a loop which alternates. Right. You have a loop where there's a multiverse war, there is a peace... A horrible piece imposed by the TVA. There's another multiverse war, and TVA starts up again, but maybe not run by the same version of Kang. Right, and maybe implying, implying, uh, imposing different rules. Well, Pete, isn't and it also kind of like maybe the, being not as easy to overthrow at the end? Right. Isn't it kind of like the Star Trek Kelvin question? Is it a different timeline or is it a parallel? universe it's a or good is there or is there really any difference between the two well okay so there's a little cartoon that i like it's like what do we want time travel when do we want it it doesn't matter <laughs> and mm-hmm. so you have to ask your question at what point did the tva exist and control time and the answer is it existed it controlled time and then it doesn't ex- doesn't exist and it stopped controlling time Mm-hmm. It's the you can no longer point to a section in the timeline or in the multiverse that says the TV was in charge because it's gone and but it's been replaced by something else. It's an interesting. It was retroactively replaced. Yeah. Unlike Kelvin diverged at a certain point. Sure. Okay. Um, which I particularly don't want to talk about. And, and this thing, according to the Star Trek Discovery, that's great. I'll keep universe. bringing it up if you don't want to talk about it. I hate new track, so. Oh, you're such an old man. I am. Sorry, Rick, what, what did you say? Yeah, according to the Star Trek Discovery, that's a parallel universe. Yeah, it's a parallel universe, right. That's another parallel universe? No, the Kelvin. Kel- no. Kelvin is a parallel universe. Oh, is Discovery yet another universe, or... No, it's based oh, on a very uh, inconsistent part of the same universe. Of Kelvin or the original series? The original okay. series. Oh, okay. It's where holograph technology existed before the Enterprise, but they just didn't use it because it broke down a lot or something. So it's like the books. This may have happened. It may not have happened. The Star Trek books. Yeah. But, okay, getting back to Loki... <clears throat> if we, if I, we must. I think Loki was really, really fun. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And did a really great job at redeeming and recasting a character that needed to be recast. I mean, you, you've invested, uh, Hiddleston has invested a lot of time in D, uh, Marvel is, and Disney invested a lot of time in this character and he can't just be the guy who loses every movie 
at some point he's got to do something else. Well, no, he's Arnold Schwarzenegger in Terminator 2. Exactly. You know, so he has to have a, a redemption arc. And by taking him out of his universe and showing that his glorious purpose was, in the great scheme of things, minuscule. And that'll letting, change a person, even someone change, like him. Right. It's like, what is it, Neil Armstrong looking out at the, at the, at the, at the, at the earth and, and realizing that nation states really don't matter. Right. Or um, Carl Sagan having Voyager turn around and take a picture of Earth um, as the pale blue dot. Right. Every everyone you've ever heard of that's ever been born is, is on that little that little dot, and right. kings and religions and they've all been fighting over tiny sections of this small little pale blue dot. Right, and that that's sort of the what's been done to Loki here. His whole animus has been cut out from underneath him, and now he gets to do something else. He's not, he, he's gone from villain to anti hero. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe he's the guy that's willing to do things at a cosmic level that heroes won't be able to do. Something about that WandaVision and Loki, I felt both had in common, was they started off and you're like, eh, this is fun, but it's kind of silly. And then the more you get into it, the more you realize it's not silly at all. It's very deep. Well, if, if anything, they are very deep, but if anything, they go in opposite directions. Loki redeems their character while WandaVision plunges that character into despair and turns her into a monster. Yeah, you're right as far as the character arcs, but as far as the the shows themselves they they're, both they're start very, off they're not very serious and then they they slowly you realize yes they are actually and, and yeah and it, it's sort of a, in both ways they're sort of subverting um humor and yeah. it also took a while for you to realize what pruning and resetting the timeline meant. yes I mean, I, I, I was wondering because I was describing it to a friend. I said they don't really explain what's going on there, and I'm wondering what really happens. What gets destroyed? Yeah. Question. And now it's it. We know it's everything. Yep. Uh, what's her name? Who was in charge of everything on the TVA level? The what, judge. The judge. Judge. All right. Number one question is why couldn't she be pruned? she's obviously been taken from I mean there's other versions of her yes what makes her different that she can't be pruned I don't know that she can't be it just it didn't no no happen. no Sylvia tried to prune her no no no, no, no. Uh, it, no. Uh, Mobius tried to prune her they, they missed him he missed yeah he missed oh he missed he missed I thought he got her no and then she seems very, uh, I don't know, still very sociopathic, and it's all about the TVA. So why is she suddenly, I want to find out what this is all about? Well, we haven't learned what her origin is. She's, she's some sort of school teacher in uh, Franklin D. Rose, uh, Delano Roosevelt High School. Sure, in that reality. Yeah, but we don't, we don't know how she became a judge. Right. And in the comics, he's Kang's love interest, which explains a lot. Oh. But in this case, you know, it's just like... In my mind, she's like the guy who opens the gate to Dorothy to meet the wizard. He doesn't yeah. care what the wizard is. He just likes having the power. And Yeah, you know, that's true. You know, and, and it doesn't matter to her what the actual source of the TVA is. She she believes in the system, and she believes that there must be a reason to do this. And because and she if she doesn't, then she's wasted her life. And, well, and and then she would have no power. Yeah, and uh, the other thing is, uh, 
uh, Kang, yes, I get it and everything, but I was still disappointed when you find out the end all be all guy in charge of the entire universe, basically. The entire, all the okay. timelines yeah. is a guy from Earth. Now, I'm getting a little tired of that, you know? I realize he's from the 31st century, it's from a thousand years from now, but he's still just a guy, a smart guy. But he's still just a guy from Earth. He's also going to be a descendant of somebody. Yeah. In the comics, he's a descendant of Reed Richards, but he started out, he was, a, he's a, they had the full story, he was a descendant of Dr. Doom. And there's a theory that they may make him a descendant of Tony Stark in this film universe. But I do get your point, Mike, is that you know. you're complaining that uh, out of the entire universe, it's very, the, the whole TVA is very anthropocentric. Yes. But in the comics, there are Kangs who are not Kang. Who are, who, they were, in the comics, there were alien who go to war with Kang, kill him, and take his uh, identity. Right. Um, well, just, I mean, think about how insanely huge, not just the universe is, but just this galaxy alone. Right. But this, so this tiny little planet, you know, the guy behind everything is a human. I just, well, I, it, yeah. Can I solve your problem by saying it would have been fun just to see Skrulls, Kree, vampires, maybe even an underpowered Thanos working for the TVA? Oh, I've been, that would have been great. Yeah. That would have solved, right? I don't know that it would have solved the problem, but well, you need I, I, I expected like maybe some Lovecraftian version of Loki or something. Right. And okay, so yes. Or I, or even or even uh what's Thor's dad's name? I just blanked. Odin. Odin. Or, or even some insane version of Odin. I mean, we're this human from the 31st century is more powerful than Odin. Come well, on. I was glad they went with Kang because that's what it was in the comics. Because I was thinking, you know, having been burnt was expecting the Fisto at the end of one division. And the power broker being somebody else and who it turned out to be at the end of Falcon and the Winter Soldier. I was saying, oh, it's gonna be it's gonna be a variant of Loki. It's gonna right. be because that That's the only then, thing that made sense with the I said I said Kang made sense, but that, and I think they're gonna save that for uh, Ant Man. Right. And I was glad to be pleasantly surprised. I mean, it would have been nice to see like a Loki in that position and you know, have see, uh, him just reveal that yes, everything you you've done, and just do the same speech. Everything that has happened to you had to happen so you could be here, so that you could take my place. I thought it was going to be like the prisoner, right? That number one and number six were the same, right? Or person. you know what would make even more sense is an insanely powerful, way more powerful version of Doctor Strange than even as powerful as Doctor Strange is. I yeah. mean, coming yeah, up. I'm just saying, to come in the source material, it is Kang or Mortis or. Yeah, yeah, I'm leaving aside the source material since I'm not familiar with it. I'm just, you know. Now, in as fact, a... in fact, he who remains is not a variant of Kang in the comics. There is a guy called Mortis who exists at the end of time, and they sort of combine. Them. Right. So as a as a Lovecraft writer and reader and whatnot, I would have loved to have seen some sort of horrific Lovecraftian entity at the end of the universe. Right. Well, what else would you expect? But I think what's going to happen in Multiverse of Madness is because the multiverse opened up, the equivalent of Cthulhu, Shuma Gorath, and the equivalent of the great old ones, the many angled ones. Are going to break, try to break into all universes. Right. What gets me with making it Kang and making it this pretty much regular guy from the 31st century who may have been a genius at one point, but has now been driven insane by the, the war and having to run down the TVA and run it, even if he's running it, you know on autopilot is even worse. 
it's the, the great conspiracy theory is that there is no one in charge. And you know, yeah. that's more horrific. It's not that there's some giant entity masterminding everything. It's that there's this, the guy who's masterminding everything is, is a moron. He's still masterminding everything. He's though. still masterminding everything, but there's no great plan. I'm not sure that he's a moron. No, he okay. More okay. He's insane. Yeah, he is now. He is now, and that's you know because he, he's had to, you know, what is it? Five impossible things for for bre- before breakfast. Frankly, uh, Doctor Who would have made more sense, you know, than this guy. <laughs> well, Kang is like. The Marvel's version of Doctor Who. We will go into yes. the we, we, we will go into the uh, comment that that Jody Whitaker is now leaving Doctor Who. Right, and so is Chris Chibnall. So good. I'm not Jody Whitaker, but Chris Chibnall. Anyway, so yes. yeah, I, I, not to poop too fine of a there point are on different, it, but there, there are different versions of where Kang is a different name and a costume traveling. Right. The, and originally he fought him originally it was like Doctor Who they, 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 he would fight himself like or just like the second and the fourth and the, the second and the sixth doctor might team up you guys remember but, the show Sliders yes yeah do you remember there's this one world governed by magic and when um or or possibly magic and it's very much a wizard of oz man behind the curtain type thing and when the kid who's a genius who invented the sliders thing uh when he figures out who it is he says i knew it because it was him it's that world's version of him right you know so well we're going to probably see ramatut the pharaoh from the future which is another version of kang Scarlet Centurion. Scarlet Centurion. Immortus. Immortus, even though some elements were in He Who Remains. Right. King. And I discovered there's a version of Kang that gets stuck in the 20th century and becomes a Norman Osborn type character um, called Mr. Mr. Griffin. And he, yeah. he, he operates a corporation called Kang, but it's spelled with a Q. I mean, I uh, swear. Yeah. The Scarlet Witch would have made more sense than this guy, you know. Oh, I, 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 I think you're. I like this guy. I like the fact that he is. First of all, he's desperate to not know what happens. Also, he was superbly acted by uh, Jonathan Majors. Yeah. Well, can I just say um, that nope. you're wrong about Star Trek, Pete, and you're wrong <laughs> about this. So. <laughs> what's wrong or possibly it's a matter I, of opinion I don't, what, <laughs> what was he wrong about star trek i don't like he, he, he hates he hates the kelvin universe i hate the kelvin universe too oh my god well not only the guys change but khan goes from being an indian to being a uh brit Brit. The, those are small points, though. Is, does the story work? Is the question. No, no, because because yes. they, they, they've cured death through tribbles or something. But the, that's the, that's a point. Yeah, the point is that Star Trek was always about science first, and then action second. And the new, the whole new stuff is all based on let's make some action films. Have you seen the original series where Kirk's getting into a fight and wooing alien princesses every every episode? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's just... but the, I didn't see there was any reason to, to redo the original episodes. Yeah, no. just invent a new start, you know. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Anyway. One thing I did like, and then I got to go about uh, Kelvin that really wasn't explored in the books. It was, but. The fact that it's not that Vulcans are unemotional. It's that, in fact, their emotions are hugely deeper than humans. And that's why they've come up with this system of controlling their emotions. But we knew that before. 
And I don't know that everybody knew that before. One, I don't know that it was that obvious. One benefit of watching Discovery is they resolve the Romulan Vulcan conflict. Okay. I haven't seen any Discovery. Now, yet. if you were wondering what ha- what the ultimate result of Spock in our universe going to Romulus was, you learned it here. Okay. That they touch on that in Picard too. Yeah. Well, it, it, it you, but you, it, this is beyond Picard. Mm, yeah. We yeah, resolved yeah. the whole fact that the, you know, we had the Romulans in exile. That gets resolved. There has been an incident on Romulus. Remember that from Star yeah. Trek Six? Yeah. An incident. The planet's broken in half. <laughs> uh, that was like it was Klingon. Uh, Oh, Klingon, right. I'm sorry. Some yeah. Klingon plan. It was equivalent to, it was sort of a... Kronos. Uh, a parallel to Chinopo. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Have we beat this dead horse? Yeah. Probably. Uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks for all to you who are patrons. Scott, thank you for, for tipping me um, during the show. And um, next week, we'll have Richard Chismar. And... Uh, Pete and Rick, thanks for being here. Thanks for sticking in to talk about Loki. So you guys have a good night, okay? Okay. I'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.